we are reconvening after our executive session. And uh, I'd request all those present and willing to please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight we're having some um, technical difficulty with getting our projector up and running. Our buildings and grants director is kindly looking to help us out with that. Um, so I'd request all those present uh, here as well as those watching at home to refer to the school committee package which is available on the school website as um, Dr. Kamina or any of the members speak to any particular topic or agenda item. The next item on the agenda is recognition. Um, does anyone have any recognition that they would like to call out tonight? Dr. Kavna, anything from nope. your end? Thank you. Um, I have one thing that I wanted to call out. I wanted to call out all of our uh, community for going out to vote for the special town election. Um, so it's a big milestone for us. So thank you very much for going out and voting. I think the high school extension, Hopkins and Elmwood portable classrooms will give us the needed space given the growth in our district. I'm also very thankful to the town clerk and all the town election workers for their service in a year filled with elections. So that's my shout out. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, it's time for public comment. If we have members here who would like to come and make a comment, please come on up. Please um, recognize yourself, your name, and your address, um, and you can come and speak. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Kavanaugh and members of the school committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Margaret Post, and I'm here tonight with a group of parents who are concerned about bus transportation. Um, I understand that the public comment time is only for three minutes per person, but I would ask that I could go over for a minute or two because I have some information from a survey that we conducted that I'd like to report to the committee. Is that okay? Thank you. Yes. We are here because we want to be part of a solution. We are also here tonight because we believe that this district has put policy and operational procedure ahead of our children's safety. Our group of 30 parents came together out of a collective concern that this district's decisions about bus stops, bus routes, and appeals have put children's safety at risk rather than use a sensible and respectful approach that engages families in the process of common sense solutions to safe and efficient bus transport. We join together out of an extraordinary frustration that district officials do not hear or adequately <clears throat> respond to the transportation concerns of many parents and families. While the experience my family faced was demoralizing and shocking, we quickly learned that other parents have more sobering and disturbing situations. I have been heartened by the ways in which the elected members of this committee have taken time to speak with me, show sincere empathy, and encourage us to be here tonight. Thank you. I understand that you may see the situation we described tonight differently and that you may think that transportation problems in our community are tied solely to enrollment, the number of students that use buses, or the fact that 80% of Hopkinton residents live on rural roads. However, our experience demonstrates multiple ways in which the current implementation of this district's policies are the result of a lack of accountability, transparency, clear communication, and sensible process. Over the past four months, our group has worked to understand what we originally experienced as individual worries about our own children's bus transportation. Through conversations with one another and a survey that we organized in December, we have heard countless stories of children who have to congregate in unsafe areas to wait for buses, or have to walk on dangerous streets without sidewalks or crosswalks to get to their bus stop, often in the dark and busy commuting times. We have heard stories of families who have been advised by Dr. Kavanaugh and her staff over email and in person to allow children to walk on or cross these dangerous roads. 
The consolidation of bus stops this year without clear communication about the criteria by which these decisions were made have further left many families in situations where they have no choice but to drive their children to and from school, increasing traffic, and putting parents in untenable situations as we juggle getting to work on time and getting our children safely to school. Contrary to the information in the PowerPoint present that was prepared for the PowerPoint presentation that was prepared for tonight's meeting, families who made appeals were given inconsistent information about forms and process. I learned tonight that one parent didn't even know that an appeal was even possible. When those appeals were denied, parents were given little to no explanation about why. We were not taken seriously when we repeatedly raised and documented specific safety issues, and we felt excluded from the decision-making process. The parents who have shared their stories express fear and an unwillingness to come forward because they believe that district officials will not take their concerns seriously or belittle them as insignificant. The more we learned about each other's experiences, the more we understood that this district's transportation policies are being applied in arbitrary and inconsistent ways. Our survey showed the following as parents' primary concerns. 44% of parents are concerned about bus stop locations. 34% how transportation issues are handled by the transportation department. 29% the length of the bus ride. And 21% bus stop changes this year. This is just a small sample of our community. Of the parents who responded, more than half had contacted the transportation, about, transportation department about their concerns, and yet 46% of those parents did not receive a reply. Less than 20% have contacted the superintendent. We have learned that this is due in, part, due in part to the feeling among parents that the superintendent and district administrators will not address or take seriously their concerns. The policies and procedures that are in place to implement transportation in this district are not working for many of us. And we are here tonight to share our experiences because we believe the policies need a comprehensive review by the school committee. In addition, the failure of effective implementation needs a public response from you, Dr. Kavanaugh beyond what will be presented in tonight's transportation, and we look forward to hearing your response. Thank you for your time and consideration. I will now invite some of the other parents from our group to share their experiences with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, my name's Sue Creswell. I live at 165 Lumber Street, and I'm not a parent, I'm a grandparent. And um, my husband and I, Don, share a lot of the responsibility of bringing up our grandchild. And this is um, a really significant concern that we've come with today. And personal history aside, because I know that there's been communication with the transportation company and with the superintendent as well, I feel that um, there's a serious safety concern with, with our children in this town. And as adults, it's our responsibility to ensure that all the children in our town are safe, regardless of what street that they live on and regardless of what policy is. If policy is preventing our children from being safe, then it is time to change policy. The most valuable resource that we have is the thing that holds closest to our heart, which, is our, which are our children. As an educator, I am appalled on how our concerns have not been seriously considered. We have had um, many conversations in our home about this. Um, we've taken up a lot of the responsibility for the transportation. And as Margaret had said as well, a lot of <coughs> parents are feeling this. And if you're looking to see how many kids are getting dropped off in the morning, that might be part of this problem that's happening because I do not feel safe sending my granddaughter to walk on a road that's this narrow at 6, 6 40 in the morning when it is dark and there's no place for her to step when there's a snow bank so as Margaret had said earlier not that we don't have any consistent um, answers. It would be my recommendation to have an unbiased citizen, hopefully here on the committee, to be able to listen to our perspectives. And that's why I come to you today to request that perhaps one of you could provide some input 
to develop reasonable alternatives for, for these safety issues. I do believe that the parents are more than willing to work, but I do feel, I feel that we have not been heard. And some of the, the um, recommendations that were given to us via email were very unprofessional. And that's what I have to say. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Christine Creswell. That was my stepmother. She helps um, with the transportation with my daughter. Um, I come to you tonight not only as a concerned parent, but I myself work for a significant school bus <coughs> transportation company. So I know the workings of the transfinder system that's used for routing. We work with many districts where the stops I feel are in play are extremely dangerous. And as a dispatcher, if I myself had implemented these stops, I wouldn't have a job. It's sad that policy is restricting safety. It's a huge concern, a huge safety concern. Um, I also felt extremely ignored. Uh, the superintendent and I have had many email exchanges and I felt brushed aside, very uncaring responses, um, some of which were just completely ignored. I had no idea there was an appeals process. Um, unfortunately, I had requested a refund where I felt I was getting nowhere. My daughter has not taken the bus at all this year. It's been a struggle as I do work very early in the morning. I have to be at work for 5.30. So I am lucky enough that I have family that can take her to school. But there are a lot of times where she's stuck here at night until someone can come and get her. I work till 6 o'clock, and it's, it's sad that she's stuck because she doesn't have safe transportation to and from school. Um, I went so far as to contact the owner of my company, and he was appalled at some of the things that I told him were happening some of the bus stops that were happening and he also tried reaching out and did not get a good response either. I appreciate you hearing us. Um, it's nice to feel like we are being heard. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Ganeri. This is my first school year here in Hopkinton. I moved from um, Rhode Island. Um, my first experience is this academic year, and we all know Rhode Island has issues with their school system, but they seem to have their buses in place, so I was pretty appalled by the transportation here in Hopkinton. Um, and I did learn that I needed to file an appeal in regards to the safety situation for our bus stop but I didn't hear a response. And throughout my constant inquiries, I never heard anything. I was told that if I write a letter, the committee would meet in October, and that I should hear something by November, and I didn't. And that's when I was able to get in touch with Margaret and realize that other families were in the same situation as myself. Um, the, I'm starting to understand a little bit more about the process and what's going on. I. Um, I can just tell you from my experience that we live on a country road where the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. It's dark outside, there's no sidewalk, um, and the trees have poison ivy in them, and now they're covered, or not currently covered in snow, but have been covered in snow. So then you, and they don't plow correctly, so then you, the kids are in the middle of the street. It is absolutely unreasonable to expect that for however many days there are in school, which is you know minus 90 days for the summer, that parents would be responsible for driving their children safely to a bus stop. 
and back from the bus stop when the point of the bus stop is to provide safe transportation to school. So the notion that every day it would be the parent's responsibility to get the kids safely to a bus stop takes away the whole purpose of having a bus stop to begin with. Because if I could take them to the bus stop, then I could take them to school. So this isn't working. My appeals, many appeals, haven't worked. The situation needs to get corrected. If you're, and I'm sure everyone has their situation, mine in particular, if you're on a country road, speed limit is above what residential speed limits are, you can't expect a child to walk on a street. I don't care if they're five, I don't care if they're 17. It is unsafe, it is nighttime. When they come home, if they come off the late bus, it is after four o'clock, it is dark. Unsafe. And it's really sad that a kid has to get hurt before this committee would actually do something because that's the way of the land. We all know it. Once a kid gets hurt is when something will happen. Let's be proactive, let's figure it out, and get it done. It's very simple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here um, to make a public comment tonight? <coughs> Thank you, everyone. I'll move on to, uh, to the next item on the agenda. Reports, Student Council. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So high school has been uh, very busy recently. Um, I was conferencing with Mr. Bishop this afternoon, um, and quite a few developments um, and events have been taking place. Uh, first and foremost, our international night was last Thursday. And uh, for those who don't know, the international night is a time for the um, foreign exchange students at our school to come together and share um, food um, and other elements of their culture with the community as a whole. Um, and it's, very, it's a great time for all, um, especially it's a really good time to focus on them and uh, all the, um, the unique perspective they bring to our school. Um, additionally, um, after February break, uh, we begin to look forward to the next uh, school year as the high school will start their course selection. Um, so the freshmen, the sophomores, and the juniors uh, will begin looking forward to next year and selecting uh, those courses after break. Um, additionally, the student council um, will be having their annual heart screenings on February 14th, uh, which has to be Valentine's Day. Um, and this is um, an event put on by Mass Heartbeat and uh, we were lucky enough to be funded by um, the Hopkinton Boosters Club. Um, and essentially, um, any student um, can uh, get an EKG, um, a non-invasive procedure, and um, can be screened for any um, potential <coughs> um, life-threatening um, heart diseases. Um, additionally, our Be Free event is this Friday at the HCA. Um, and those are always very uh, Good time for the school community as a whole. Um, the coaches versus cancer basketball game um, is happening this Friday. Um, additionally, the um, we've talked a lot about the challenge success survey, and one thing that Mr. Bishop is very excited about is that those results have come in, and um, Mr. Bishop is planning a joint students uh, faculty uh, meeting in order to discuss some of those results. Um, with any uh, members of the, the school as well as the faculty um, in order to um, debrief some of the, those results. Um, and that's, that's about all that's going on so far. And of course, we're very excited for uh, February break as well. That's great. A variety of things you have going on there. Um, I'm, more, uh, I'm curious about this Be Free event you talk about mm -hmm. at HC. Can you share a little more? Um, so there is a club at, um, at the high school called Be Free. And essentially what it is, is um, it's a night of music and I believe um, free Chipotle. Um, so two things that a lot of high, st high school students uh, r really enjoy. And uh, what it is, is um, a night um, devoted to substance -free, um, a substance-free event um, in which students can have fun in a very safe environment um, and um, have have time to, uh, or spend time with, uh, with their peers. 
it's, it's great. I'm actually very interested in the uh, success, challenge success results myself. I hope you're all able to bring back an update uh, mm -hmm. for us. <coughs> yep. Thank you. Well, thank you. Of course. We'll Happy see you break. Soon. I know. Yeah, enjoy yeah. your break. As well. The next item on the agenda, transportation report. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have been meeting with the with parents who are concerned about transportation in the district and we have a transportation subcommittee uh, there are two members of the school committee and and I and so one of the things that we've been doing is really sort of dissecting our current transportation policy and then kind of gathering data facts and figures and putting them all together so that people will have sort of a sense of where we are as a community um, just I guess in terms of the data so these are just some quick facts. Uh, we currently run 29 buses, and next year we have two additional buses in the budget, so that will take us to 31 buses. All of our buses are buses that we would call 77-seaters. If you are an elementary school child, we could probably put 77 children on that bus, but if you are middle school and high school, there's no way we're getting 77 of you on that bus. So. Um, you know, there are places where we will oversubscribe a bus route uh, because, you know, not every child is riding the bus every morning and every afternoon. So uh, last year we were wondering how many students in grades 7 to 12 bought bus passes. And I should say this year. Uh, and the answer to that is 1,282 or 70% of the available students. And when we say available students, it's only students who are in grades 7 to 12. K to 6 get free busing in Hopkinton. Uh, so how many kids bought parking passes? And you can buy both, just to be clear. You could have a bus pass and a parking pass. We had 205 seniors and 135 juniors for a total of 340 bus passes, or 54% of the available students uh, bought bus passes this year. Uh, each bus costs us about $70,000 if the... Uh, bus is running three different routes. It's 69,480, um, and two, two or three if the bus is just running a one-tier route, it's 66,780. Uh, so imagine we can put 50 students on a bus for our secondary students and we charge them $155 per student. That means that our revenue is $7,750 per bus, and you know it's costing closer to $70,000 to run a, a single bus. Our bus company is Michael J. Conley & Sons. Sometimes people will say, well, why don't you look for another bus company? And when you put it out to bid, typically we get one bidder, and that bidder is Michael J. Conley & Sons. So people are wondering, how do we create our bus routes? And even though we have software called TransFinder, it's sort of a misconception to think that you can simply press a button and voila, all of the bus routes are created. Um, it is true that Mrs. Fitzpatrick and I, she is our director of transportation, we've actually gotten in cars and driven around to different areas um, to sort of see where a consolidated bus stop would, would land and how far would a student have to walk from his home to that consolidated bus stop or how far would a parent have to transport that student from his home to a consolidated bus stop. Uh, so in the whole process of looking at the lay of the land, looking at maps, thinking about uh, sometimes we use you know, sort of Google Earth to kind of get down, you know, in the front lawn to say what would it look like for a student to have to walk. Uh, it takes her about three months to do that. Uh, we construct, you know, obviously elementary routes. We construct Hopkins routes. We construct high school routes. And um, there are times when we have students who are riding different buses in the morning and different buses in the afternoon. So it's a complicated process. So Massachusetts general law tells us that for students who are in kindergarten through sixth grade, we by law have to provide transportation for those students if they live more than two miles from school. If you don't live more than two miles from school, 1.9, 1.8, 0.5, whatever, a, a child in K to um, six would have to find his or her own transportation to school, whether that meant riding a bike or walking or, but Hopkinton is a school district that provides that transportation to everyone because we sincerely believe that it's not just for a student who lives 1.5 miles away to have to walk when his, you know, half mile away neighbors is, is getting a ride to school on school bus. Um, state legislation does allow districts to charge a bus fee for students who live less than two miles from school. Um, 
in grades 7 through 12. And you can't charge a bus fee if that student is a low-income student or someone who is eligible for free and reduced lunch. All right, I pretty much just covered this, that we bus everybody K to 6, and um, the Hopkinton Public Schools provides transportation to all of our students who purchase bus privileges, regardless of your distance from home to school. So when you sort of think about you know, the lay of the land for Hopkinton, we are a very large geographic footprint, and we have uh, about 3,916 students today. So uh, not all of them are obviously using transportation, but that's a lot of students to move across a, a lot of space. So we do have a Hopkinton Public School policy, and our policy, and this is governed by the school committee, states that it's the responsibility of the parent or guardian to ensure the safe passage of his or her or their child over roadways to an established bus stop. It's the responsibility of the parent to ensure the safety of his or their child at the established bus stop. And the district's responsibility for the child begins when the child boards the bus at the pickup location. And the responsibility ends when the child disembarks at the drop-off location after school. So this is in place currently. So where does Hopkinton fall in terms of how much we are charging for our busing? For the 1920 school year, which is where we are right now, Hopkinton charged $155 per student with a 310 or a two student sort of cap. So if you had three children, you were really only paying for two of them. Currently, Holliston is paying 240 per student with a $720 cap. Ashland pays 350 with a $700 family cap. Medfield does not charge their students anything in terms of busing. Uh, Bellingham charges $300 with a $600 family cap. Northboro Southboro does not charge because they're a regional district, so a fee is not applicable. And Lexington charges $330 with an $825 family cap. That's an interesting um, metric they charge for sort of two and a half kids. So one of the things that we are considering, I mean, realistically, our students are riding for less than a dollar a day. Um, so if you think about morning and afternoon pickup, our students are riding for less than 50 cents a ride. Uh, one of the things that we have considered is increasing the price of a bus pass for next year. Um, obviously not carved in stone. It's something that this body will determine. Uh, but the dollar amount that we have on that slide right there is $200 a student with a $400 family cap. And that would still bring us in lower than most districts. Oh, and this is only for grade 7 through 12, correct? Only for grade 7 through 12. And do we currently have a cap? Yes, $310. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So if parents do, in fact, have a concern about their child's bus stop, um, you can go on the transportation website. You can see on the left-hand side uh, what the transportation website looks like. Up on top, you can see that there's an orange um, clickable link to bus stop review request form. And we will admit that that bus stop review request form is probably confusing. So if you looked at it, you might not know what it ex exactly it is. Um, that's how you make an appeal. So in 2018-19, we heard 57 appeals. 15 of those were approved and 42 were denied. In 2019-2020, we heard 53 appeals, 12 were approved, and 41 were denied. And people, I think, wonder what was the nature of some of those appeals. Uh, those, the majority of those reviews were requested because the parents were unhappy with the consolidation of bus stops. Um, and I think that I had explained this when we met with some of the parents, that if you have a high school, middle school bus run, and the kids have disembarked the bus, and the bus is ready to leave, say, Hopkinton High School at 7.15 or 7.20, it really doesn't have a whole lot of turnaround time before it has to get out there, pick up students, and get them back to Hopkins. And then we also have a, a very small window to get the kids, after they get off the bus at Hopkins, to get out, pick up all the students, and get them back to Marathon and Elmwood. So another thing that we're thinking about, and this will happen on a subsequent slide, is removing that middle tier of busing to enlarge the window. And that should sort of help us with you know, some of that, that need, I think, for those consolidated stops where we're sort of you know, racing those buses through and 
having fewer stops. Um, I know it doesn't seem like much, but if you think about when you stop the bus, you know, it's not that the kids can just immediately get on because the bus driver has to wait to ensure that the oncoming traffic is actually stopped, your stop sign has to come out, the kids get in the bus, you have to make sure they are fully seated before you actually let that bus drive forward. So um, a, a stop actually does take some time. Uh, we have some people who are unhappy because they want their children to be able to cross in front of uh, the bus. So when the bus stops, they would like for their child to be on the other side of the road and cross in front. We are trying our best to do all door side pickup. Now that's not possible to do 100% door side pickup, but it's so much safer for kids because what we see happening nationally is there are people, the bus can be stopped, a car isn't coming, the kids are coming across the street, suddenly a car does come and sometimes they come around the bus from behind and it's very difficult for a bus driver to see. So we are looking to do um, all door side <laughs> stops whenever possible. Uh, some parents who live on private roads make requests and, you know, our bus company does not travel on private roads and Mass General Law actually has a sentence that will say a bus, uh, a school committee cannot compel buses to run on a private road. Um, and then finally, parents express safety concerns and make requests to move um, the bus stop. So who hears those appeals? Because I don't want you to think that it's one woman sitting behind her computer over in the central office. Uh, that first Friday in October, we do sit in a conference room together. And there are school resource, resource officers with us, the bus, de, bus dispatcher who actually works for Conley, the transportation coordinator who works for the Hopkinton Public Schools, the superintendent, and the director of finance and operations. So there's a, a good group of us in there, you know, anywhere between seven and eight of us in the room as we're making those kinds of decisions. I know people are not happy that we wait until that first week in October. We do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we start with our bus routes, you know, especially with your little ones, you know, they're confused about getting on the bus, confused about getting off the bus, and the bus routes take a little bit of extra time at the beginning, and then once the bus drivers get going and the kids have all figured it out, by the time you get to that very first weekend in October, you know, typically everybody's got it figured out, so the bus is running at the pace that we can imagine will be typical. You know, and the kids have kind of figured things out at that point too. So that is why we wait, we wait that, that period of time. I know it can be frustrating. All right, and then we've heard from people who are not concerned about bus stops or appeals, but they are concerned about children's safety and student behavior on the buses. Our bus drivers are not disciplinarians. Their job is to drive that school bus and really only to drive that school bus. We don't want them doing much else. So when there is a concern on the bus, what has to happen is the bus driver has to pull that bus over and wait for whatever is happening in that bus to stop before the bus driver is allowed to move that bus back out into um, traffic. Uh, so what happens is the bus drivers will write students up and discipline slips go to our assistant principals. I can tell you that as of today, our assistant principals have received probably in excess of 200 of those discipline reports in each one of those schools. Each of the schools. Each of the elementary schools. And it happens because you might get, you know, two a day, right? And we've hit the hundredth day of school. Some days you get three, some days you get one, some days you get none. Um, and I don't know, maybe 200 is high, but it's, you know, maybe 175. They get a lot of them. And they spend their mornings calling students down to the office to say, do you know what you did on the bus today? And they know what they did on the bus today. But, you know, a lot of our kids have that sort of, repeat offender thing going on. And we try our best. Um, but if a parent really has a concern that their child is um, being, you know, harassed, um, bullied, teased, whatever word you want to use on the school bus, the person to reach out to is the building administrator. You should not call the bus dispatcher. You shouldn't call the transportation coordinator because those people work in transportation. They don't work in discipline. So at the building level is where discipline is served. All right, so some of the challenges that we face as we do our very best to transport our students. Uh, and this is what I was getting at before. We have three runs, 29 buses. Uh, the first run 
takes off at 2 in the afternoon, and then at Hopkins, it will take off between 2.30 and 2.35, and then at Marathon, they are leaving between 3.15 and 3.30. You can see that there is not an awful lot of time. You know, when you're talking about a 30-minute a window or you're talking about you know, a 40-minute window, that really doesn't do a lot to get those kids all the way out to the furthest points in town and then back again. So literally, we will have, you know, 16 kids at Hopkins getting on a bus that will take them very far from Hopkins and then back to, the bus goes back to Elmwood or Marathon. But it's really the only way, time-wise, to make that happen. Um, in almost all cases, we try to limit student walking um, to 0.5 miles or less from their home. And, you know, again, I go back to that policy that says we do not expect students to walk, but we do expect that it is the parent's obligation to get the child to safely to the bus stop. Our obligation begins when the student boards the bus. Many of Hopkinton roads are winding country roads. Many of them do not have sidewalks. Many of our roads, uh, roads are used as cut-throughs for Route 495. Elmwood, unfortunately, is that geographic outlier, so it takes a lot of time to get into Elmwood and out of Elmwood. Uh, Hopkinton is geographically a very large town with a lot of open land, so it's not like you, know, you have several houses all packed in together. Very often there's great big spaces between homes where you go long stretches of country road before you get to the next neighborhood. And then finally, what are some of the statistics about our kids who have either boarded the wrong bus or had a child care mix up? Um, or we're deemed lost. And when we say lost, we don't really mean that we have lost a child on our buses. What it means is momentarily at a school, we say, oh my gosh, you know, Johnny's mom just called and he did not get off the bus. Where do you think he is? And for a few minutes, we think that he might in fact be lost, but then we look at some of the other buses he rides, we call the school resource officer, and inevitably within a few minutes, you know, he's found. You know, typically it's, he thought it was the day to go to his aunt's house, or he thought it was the day to go to daycare or whatever. Um, so 36 is, is a good number to sort of have that kind of scare. You know, that's not something that our building principals look forward to in the afternoon as we wait for the buses to clear. And over 140 students have been brought back to school this year. And we bring kids back to school when we look and there's no parent waiting or, you know, we think, okay, this kid should not be on this bus today. There's no way to drop him off. And then we bring the child back to school. Dr. Kavanaugh, is the 36 the number of instances? Yes, it's the number of instances. I mean, I guess, you know, we have a, a spreadsheet where we put down what's happened, uh, but, you know, the same student it could have happened to twice, or, you know, it could be 36 different children. So the 140 that are being brought back to school, presumably the ones that, it, because my recollection from when my kids were at, in the younger grades, is that the only parents that are required to be at the stop, the way our policy reads, is kindergarten possibly parents yes that still that's true so are they also so are those primarily kindergarten students being brought back or are there other situations where the bus driver is looking and, and making the assessment that the situation is not safe that day yes so there could be you know there could be a time when you have a well I mean I guess when we look at the 36 some of the 36 could be captured in the 140 sure. because if I'm a second grader and uh oh I got on the wrong bus today you know sometimes the bus driver is able to take that student back to where he was really supposed to go. But what we try to do is just have them come back to the school so that, you know, that person becomes, the building principal becomes responsible for the child. The, the other thing that happens, too, as well, is um, a lot of times there's parents there to meet the children, even mm -hmm. though they're not kindergarten. And on days where the parent actually did not show up, the children are uncomfortable getting off the bus because okay. somebody is typically right. there. That um, makes sense. So it is. It does go beyond kindergarten. Yeah. That's that's reassuring, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is it fair to assume that most of these instances are elementary grade? Yes. We don't track this at all for middle school, high school. <laughs> they can get off the bus. Just double checking. Yeah. So some of the things that we are working on for the year 2021. <laughs> Uh, we have divided these into what is procedural, and procedural things are the things that the school department is responsible for. Policy are the things that the school committee is responsible for. So what will happen uh, when a person comes in to buy a bus pass in, say, August 28th? What happens is we put a moratorium on that, 
And so it takes a very long time for our students to get on a bus from the time that you, you know, sort of buy that, that bus pass or from the time that you, you know, call up and you say, hi, you know, this is Mrs. Jones and right now my child is supposed to be getting off the bus at, you know, Kids Row on Hayden Row on Monday and Wednesday, but I want to change that. The reason we have that moratorium is that we have so many people who will call in August and make requests for changes that instead of doing them sort of one at a time so your child gets on today but then Mrs. Barat's child doesn't get on for three weeks, we just do them all over time so that everybody gets on at the same time. We are going to work hard to reduce that because it's a very long time, we think. Um, and the same thing, the lag time between when you pay your late registration and you're p placed on a bus, that is also something that we're trying to reduce the, that time on. You know, we feel like if you've made your bus payment, then you should get on a bus as quickly as you can. Again, because we're putting so many kids on buses, we can't, maybe we can't process that overnight. Uh, the website that I showed you earlier, hopefully those forms will become more accessible so that you can take a look at that website and know exactly what it is you're clicking on. We might be shifting to a two-tier system, and we would have to then shift school start time slightly. So that might mean that um, our high school, middle school kids would stay in the same place, but it might mean that you know the three elementary is going to have to choose sort of a start time wherever that lands. Um, and then we are adding a Kidsboro location at Elmwood next year. So I think that that makes things more convenient for the kiddos who and there are are there 60 of them who are currently at Elmwood that go, have to go to either Marathon or at least. Hopkins, yeah. So if you open a Kidsboro location, that might be 60 children who get to stay put, which is better. Um, in terms of policy, we are thinking about slightly increasing that bus fee in the family cap, as I showed you on a previous slide, considering 200 students with a $400 cap. And um, trying to reduce the complexity of all those vacant held seats. So if we have folks who are, you know, they have two different buses in the morning and two different buses in the afternoon, uh, what ends up happening is we have empty seats with buses driving around because we're technically holding a seat for a child. I'm sorry, Dr. Kavanaugh, why would they have two buses in the morning? <coughs> well, one morning you might... And, you know, so if you have a mom and a dad living in the district, you know, you have every right to be on those two different buses. But you could get on, you know, at your grandma's house one day, you know, under family care and at your mom's another day. Or you could get on at, like, you know, the kids for a morning location and, you know. I thought they were getting on one bus, getting off, getting on another bus, oh, no. getting off. Okay. They're just leaving from two different sure. locations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So I... I am kind of answering some of the question here because we had someone who did write in today uh, because he had looked at the packet at home and had asked about um, transportation. I'll just read his answers very quickly. Uh, he wondered about the overall transportation budget. Um, this year it's 1,791,000 and next year it will be 2,024,000. Um, the transportation percentage of the overall this year and next year, it's 4% of both years' budgets. Uh, the year-to-year -year percent increase in transportation. So regular day transportation budget has increased by 233,000 to reflect the contractual increase of 40,000. Um, that's how much more we will be paying to Conley bus. Two additional buses at about 70,000 apiece is 142,000, and that just addresses our student enrollment and traffic issues. Um, <coughs> And the account also reflects a decrease in the use of transportation revolving offset by $50,000. Um, and we got a discount from Conley, is that correct, when we built the bus parking lot? Right, so that's in the, in the revolving account. This specifically speaks to the we are using $250,000 of bus fee revenue to offset the operating budget, but we're really only bringing in closer to 200,000. So for the 2021, we're only using an offset of 20,000. So that 50,000 change <coughs> looks like an increase to the transportation budget because we're not offsetting it by that revenue. Uh, the percent impact on transportation on the overall year to year increase, uh, 233,000 to the total increase of 400,000, no, 4 million. Well, million. 4264000 or 5%. And the cost of two additional buses is 142000 as we had said before. <coughs> um, 
Dr. Kamino, when I look at the budget numbers, the transportation number is at around 3 million with a 5.7% overall of the pie. Does it include some other transportation? So this is just regular day. Okay. There is also special ed transportation and homeless. Okay. So this, uh, so this, what is, we're this about? is just regular, regular day, Connolly bus. Okay. So the rest, about a million, is towards these other aspects yes. that you talked about. Okay. All right. Questions and thoughts? I, I have some thoughts, but I know that, um, you know, along with Dr. Kavanaugh, Jen, you <coughs> and Amanda had met. I'm um, curious to hear your thoughts and views also. So happy to go in any order. Um, I know Nancy. Do you want me to start? Sure. <coughs> um, well, I had a, a question about your opinion, Dr. Kavanaugh. Do you think that if we shift from three to two tiers, there won't be a need for these consolidated bus stops as much, which mean parents and kids have to walk in the dark. So I had sent something out to the teachers today because, you know, this was going to be presented tonight, and I didn't want them not to know the answer to that. Right. Um, but the truth is we really don't know that answer at this point in time. Uh, we are currently running simulated bus routes, so okay. what would it look like if, you know, we did that for all the secondary students, all the elementary students, if we ran two different bus routes. So for example, if in the morning you get on the bus at your mom's, but in the afternoon you get off the bus at Kidsborough at Hayden Row, we would run two different bus routes so that there would be no empty seat in either one of those buses. Like we would have accounted for the fact that you're in two different places. And the second piece is, you know, so we're running, is it 26 buses out of Hopkins in the afternoon? Um, 21. 21. So to eliminate those, you know, I don't know, would Conley give us a discount because we're not running that bus or would they not? You know, that's something that we really haven't thought much about. I mean, we've thought about it. We don't have the answers to it. Yeah, I mean, basically what would happen is we, we only have very few one-tier buses and okay. it's the same cost for a three-tier and a two-tier. So there's no discount in going from a three-tier to a two-tier. It's the same cost. That's the way the contract is. But, but would it improve safety because there's not as quick a turnaround? So by having more time in between, basically what you will be able to do is actually maximize the capacity on the buses. So, you know, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, we have some buses that are running that are maybe 20% capacity because they have to go out in 15 minutes and get back in 15 minutes. So what you're going to see is actually maximizing the capacity. And, <coughs> really speaks to kind of where we are budget-wise mm -hmm. in terms of if we're going to run the system, we have to be as efficient as possible. Um, do I see less consolidation? Y you know, that's very difficult to say because most of Hopkinton are country roads with no sidewalks. So consolidated bus stops are at street cross corners. So, you know, will that go away and we increase the number of bus stops that are at individual homes, that's difficult to say, but that would probably not improve your efficiency. Can I ask a follow-up on the two-tier? <laughs> um, if we did go to a two-tier system, might it be possible in looking at the timing of the whole thing so that nobody has to get on in the dark? That if we're not trying to fit three it, tiers into between 625 and whatever time, 9 o'clock when the last stop happens. In yeah, so, in, in it, so that's, that's really a longer conversation in terms of where do these school times go. What we were really looking at is just aligning all three elementary schools. We weren't looking at changing the times of the middle school, high school. I understand that, but if we're looking at safety for the buses, surely having people not get on the bus in the dark would improve, potentially improve perceived safety, would be mine. And I, I have to say too, you know, I, I do know we have all these winding country roads, but I'm afraid to drive down Lumber Street, much less walk down it, right? And I, I only really know that because I've lived here now for 15 years, and when I first lived, you know, my first however many years were I was oblivious to it, but now, I mean, that, that is a treacherous road. So I, I feel the concerns, and I also understand 
the financial constraints and the desire to be efficient. So I just wanted to go down the, <clears throat> did you have any other thoughts, Meg? Oh, I have many thoughts, but I'll let Jen go. Okay. <laughs> I know Amanda is also waiting there, so should we stop there? Amanda? Oh, she's not on. her. She's getting Do on. you have to Take her mute? microphone mic. Be off. Okay. She'll turn, she can turn it on. Hi. Hi. I don't have any questions at this time. I think um, you can just continue. Okay. Jen. Yeah, I mean, I, Amanda and Dr. Kavanaugh and I sat together, and while she was, Dr. Kavanaugh was putting this presentation together, and we tried to brainstorm all of the concerns that had been brought to our attention and, and do what we could to address them in the presentation. Um, but I think, you know, the hardest part and the part that we hear everybody here saying is safety, and, and it's a tricky thing to, um, I mean, yes, walking, a kid walking on a narrow country road in the dark, it's hard to argue that that's safe. But it's also um, a, a tricky situation because we are constrained. I mean, the rest of the community, the community that don't have students in our school, are still paying for all of this too. And, and I w they want our kids to be safe too. So it's just trying to find a balance where it, it, there's no easy answers to the problem of transporting 4,000 kids. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that it's, it, it's going to be an ongoing struggle because, you know, finding a way to get all those kids to a place where buses can pick them up and, and just door-to-door -door service is, an, is not a, f a fiscally responsible way to do it. And I don't want to say that when you take the safety piece, of course the safety piece should always outweigh the money piece, but you know, it's, it, there's really a lot, of, a lot of working parts and it doesn't appear to be any easy solutions to this concern. So, you know, I think a lot of thought has gone into this. I think um, the idea of the two-tier buses may allow for a little more wiggle room in a couple of places and, you know, in the future may actually save us money if we negotiate a new contract. Who knows? But it's, it's a possibility. There may be room for adjusting start times. We didn't, you know, it was like this is very preliminary. Like, she, like Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned, it was something that we just talked about and, um, you know, quickly even said, hey, maybe this will address the issue of the very early start times at the at the secondary schools but again there's so many working pieces that and everything kind of trickles down so even though on surface value it's or it's on the surface it seems very easy like just change it, it, it there's so many pieces and it it's there is not a lot of easy answers yeah so I, I have a question that probably is going to need to be brought back at a future time because it's pulling a statistic out, but it, the bus passes years ago actually were more expensive. And the school committee at, at the time, it was mm -hmm. this is before my time, had intentionally was trying to phase bus fees out. I, I would be curious, because I don't actually remember what the bus fees used to be uh, back, it, it, I believe it was over 200 So I can tell you. Oh, I, I didn't expect that right at the top. <laughs> so the bus fee back in 2011-12 was 210 with a family cap of 420. And we did talk about that too as we were putting this presentation together because it was before my time too, but I knew it had happened. So, um, yeah. but, you know, our predecessors tried to take that burden off the families, but it, again, it's another piece where, you know, there are so many people in town who don't have children in the schools who are bearing that burden of our transportation which many of them will happily do so and others not so happily do so. So that's trying to balance that is a very a big challenge. One of the other things that was done at the time that I really did like was the elimination of the K to 6 because it, was, it did create an unfair balance where your neighbor who was a half a mile further away got free busing and you didn't. That's all I have for now. Yeah, I guess I've, I've been a little torn just listening to all of this. Um, you know, the pain that the parents express is real. And what we heard tonight was mostly around the appeals and, you know, some of those aspects. But over the past couple of years, I've certainly heard, uh, you know, about the length of the bus routes. 
especially for the very young, you know, the kindergarten <coughs> for second grade kids, you know, almost an hour sometimes. Um, I've also heard about, uh, you know, some, I know the bus drivers are not supposed to be disciplining, uh, but they have to sometimes, you know, when they pull over and, you know, some concerns on, on that front. Um, I have seen young kids being uh, picked up by another young kid on Main Street. Uh, these are things that I have observed over time. And I realize that, you know, this is not easy like Jen, how you were saying, right? We're talking about thousands of children being transported. Obviously, when you're looking at it, safety is also topmost on your minds and whoever is working on this front. I guess a big piece of this is also growth. You know, we've, we've been growing so rapidly, so that also adds to the mix. So I, I'm hearing a lot of layers of things, right? Whether it is related to the appeals process, whether it is about the monetary impact, whether it is about the timing and the tiering, right? Um, and also this aspect of not doing, you know, multiple stops in the afternoon for kids. It's a lot that we're trying to tackle here. Mm -hmm. And if we are to tackle all of this, um, I would really uh, want some kind of a group come together, um, yet another committee, I guess, is what I'm thinking. If you want to tackle something of this nature, you need to first open the lid. You know, you have done a great job here doing the first cut of looking at all the issues that have been brought forth. But in terms of solutioning, I think we need partnership here with parents, with school committee members, with your expertise to figure out, you know, what's the best path forward. If you're putting $2 million into this, I would want it to work. I, I guess it is working for a lot of people, but if there are dissatisfied uh, groups of people, we do need to look at that. We do need to address it somehow is where I'm at. Um, I know, Nancy, at some point you had also talked about, you know, the timing. The, uh, and I don't know if that fits into this as well. Right. That's where I'm at. And we don't have an extra, say, 210000 to get three more buses to ensure the safety of children, right? You want six fewer teachers to teach those children. No, I don't want to compromise <laughs> the on that I know. count. I know. That's the but problem. I just don't feel comfortable. So we had originally put in three buses. Yeah. And we did take one out. So it's you know, it's it's a balance <clears throat> with everything, all yeah. the constraints on the operating budget to get to where we are and we're still not at a at a balanced budget. Um, so, the, looking at if we consider raising the fee a little bit, would that, that because that money is presumably not accounted for in our budget, as is, would that be to allow an additional bus or to be a? I mean, it's, I know that small of an increase times 1,282 students I mean, is not as much as so what we'd like it to be. <coughs> I mean, that, that's what you have to keep in mind. So, you know, multiply whatever that increase is times, you know, 1,000 students. That it, 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 won't it won't cover the bus. Not An additional that. bus. Yeah. If, you, if you raised it $50 times, it, it gives you some, it gives you some leeway. Having met with our town counterparts today, if they're watching, I bet they're very nervous when we say this. <laughs> well, so <laughs> it, it, that conversation did come up too when Amanda and, and Dr. Kavanaugh and I, and I met, and that was one of the things that, as we thought about how we're, you know, at this sort of 1.4 million dollars over what they would like the town would like us to be at, one of the ways that we might be able to chip away at that number is by balancing out the transportation costs. So it wouldn't be adding another bus; it would be an attempt. To rectify this 1.4 million dollars that we're we don't that we need that we don't have. Dr. Kavanaugh, would you mind going back to the previous slide where you had some recommendations? So I, I think some of these aspects um, are appealing to me with your efforts that are on that you're planning to do. Um, I, I would want us to see a little more. You know, what could we prioritize? 
and what is low hanging fruit if you will you know can we standardize i think we heard some concerns around you know you talked about making forms more accessible mm -hmm. or if the processes are not clear to people how can we make sure that we distribute that kind of information to people i think those might be very easy to do mm -hmm. um, at the same time i don't want to forget something that one of the members said is we shouldn't have to wait till something happens no you know before we act on its own i'm glad we are being proactive here and thinking about some of these aspects. So I would hope that, you know, if this can be detailed a little further and some steps yeah. with some concrete dates of achievement, you know, when you talk about making forms more accessible, when is that <coughs> going to happen? And, um, you know, how will you distribute that information? Or if we are consolidating, what is the process for consolidation. I think if that clarity exists for the community, it'll help. I know you have so many other things that you're working on, and this is yet another thing. Uh, unfortunately, this is the place we are in, uh, where that's what our community is looking for. In terms of follow-up, is the um, policy working group working to bring back uh, uh, proposed changes to this policy? We were is thinking about opening the policy, yes. yes. I know that the moment we talk about taking out that flexibility, that will again bring up a whole lot of conversation. So I think whenever we try to make those shifts, I think some conversations leading up to those decisions are needed. Um, some community conversation, sending a note out, uh, perhaps a broad survey. Uh, it could be a many, many things. I know we haven't assigned a working group as such. I know you all have met more on the policy front. I don't know if there is any inclination for a working group around this. Uh, maybe we can think about it a little bit. I, my gut feeling is that it, it rests best with the policy working group that has been working some with the, okay. and to have them work you know, with feedback they're getting from the community. Okay. Or rather than. What do you think? Yeah. Jim? I, I, I think we need to get as much information as we can from the folks who it will affect the most, but I also think we, <coughs> if we created yet another <laughs> subcommittee, that it would slow it down. And I think it needs to happen fast. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would rather not throw an anchor out in, in terms of making changes to what needs to be changed, mm -hmm. and I think a working group would do that. So I think, again, to my point that there are so many working parts here. Folks want stuff to change last week. If we have another working group, they won't change until at least the fall, um, if not later, because we've been known to bring back the policy two, three, four, five times. Um, so I think you know, there's some hard things that we're just going to, as a community, have to work through in terms of transportation because we need to ensure safety, we need to ensure that we can afford it, we need to ensure that the kids aren't on the bus for an hour. Um, you know, one parent is angry because their child's bus stop is inappropriate in their opinion and then another child parents loves their bus stop but it's an hour and 15 minutes before their kindergartner gets home and they're not allowed to eat on the bus and the kid's crying and so we have so many legitimate concerns but to try to piece all those things together, I think we have to make some hard choices about how we're going to make adjustments in the policy and, and handle those adjustments as a community. Yeah, that's why I, I think there's a lot, a lot to absorb here. Yep. Uh, perhaps, Dr. Kavner, you can, you've heard us all, perhaps you'll take this back and come back with um, some follow-up suggestions. How sure. So the procedural things on the top are the things that fall yeah. within the purview of the school department, and those are things that we'll be working on for 2021. Um, and then obviously the policy things are the things that fall under the purview of the school committee. And I think the policy working group is prepared to open that policy. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Anything from um, our remote She's participant? Head, no. She's shaking her head. Okay. Sounds <laughs> great. We're running about 40 minutes late. Um, so moving on to the next item on the agenda. Actually, we're going to take a few things out of order yes, because yep. uh, we have some guests here tonight. Um, so the first, we're going to <coughs> skip to old business, item B, solar battery storage for Marathon School. Ms. Rothamek. Thank you. And I'm going to invite uh, two people up to come join um, in case there are further questions. So this was presented back in um, November 
basically what we're looking to do is we have finished putting solar um, on all of the roofs of Marathon. What we're looking to do now is add battery storage to that solar. And basically um, what that allows is right now solar energy is just uh, sent back into the grid as it's produced. When you add a battery component to it, then you can time it so it's released into the grid really at the more optimum times um, <coughs> as when, you know, electricity, the value of electricity and the cost of electricity varies throughout <coughs> the day. So it would be programmed to optimize when that is sent out and really maximize the money for, for us at Hopkinton. Um, to give you an idea of some of the places where these battery storage projects are are, have been put in place. Uh, there's two projects at Harvard. One of them is Harvard's House Zero. Um, they're also in place at Tufts, MIT, Roxbury Latin. They're also in place in um, Boston schools, Sterling, Ashburnham, Charlton, Winchenden, Plainville, Amesbury, Martha's Vineyard, Taunton, Milford, just to name a few of the uh, towns that are also pursuing this same um, type of storage project moving forward. Um, so I've invited um, Tom, Poirier. Tom Poirier and Mr. Person as, as well to if there were any um, uh, questions. And all that this allows when the school committee takes their vote um, is this allows the project to move forward to go to a permitting process. So in the permitting process it will go before all of the experts put, um, building, fire, and, you know, they would have to sign off on everything to do with this with this project. But if there are any specific questions, they're here for that, or I can answer. Questions? Good evening. Hello. Thanks for coming. Hi. <laughs> Amanda actually had voiced some concerns, though, just, just to get clarification from the fire department and from, and from, from you, Tim. So I don't know, do you, is your mic on, Amanda? Do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, no, I just um, I just wanted to know if you could take a minute and explain what the install would look like and then talk about um, any necessary training or um, precautions that the fire department will have to take because it's a new kind of storage device or, you know, new technology. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> footprint that the uh, battery storage would take up, I think, is about an 8 by 8 uh, concrete pad that it would sit on. And it essentially looks like a, um, it looks like a cabinet outside. So it, uh, with doors on it, so you'd be able to access. You don't go into the cabinet itself. You access everything from the outside. Um, and then we're going to put a fence around that and obviously bollard so um, any vehicles couldn't um, crash into it or or and it won't be unsightly because it'll have the fence and privacy screening around it um, so that's essentially the install it would go uh, behind the marathon school we're still determining a, a proper location for it um, and some of that will be dictated by the uh, fire code that tom can talk about uh, in a little more detail, but some of that will be dictated by the fire code where the where the um, storage unit could land. Yeah. So with regards to the installation, um, when we heard about this opportunity, we attended a couple of state-based trainings. One through the Fire Prevention Association of Massachusetts. The other one through the uh, Mass Building Officials Association. And um, what we've learned is a lot of these installations, um, when they're designed to a UL standard as well as the uh, the most current standard is NFPA 855, which is nas the national standard. Um, it's the safest installation. So, um, you know, we've gone, done some trainings, learned about that, and realized that there's a real low risk with this, with regards to it. Um, it's a new technology, but it's something that we on the fire department are, you know, every time we're trying to get as much information as we can and just pass that along to everyone on the department. Um, there are other installations in town that are being proposed right now, not necessarily at a school, but um, it's coming. And uh, we are learning and just, it's a quick moving industry. Um, it's probably uh, been a little more, um, it's moved along a little faster on the West Coast. 
So I'd say a lot of a lot of people are more comfortable with this on the west coast and the east coast, but um, it is coming here. So. Yeah. Any other questions? I just wanted to thank you and uh, thank Ms. Rothermick for um, sort of taking the time to to um, get this information on the install and the safety and so forth. I'm excited about it. I mean, it's it's certainly a um, a great green initiative. I just um, personally wasn't skilled enough to know if it was safe. So I feel much more comfortable knowing that the fire department is behind this and um, has had a chance to look into it. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion to authorize Ms. Rotha make the authority to negotiate and execute a contract with NLX North America Inc. to provide the battery storage mm -hmm. solution for the Marathon School. Yes. So moved. A motion Second. by Nancy. Second by Meg. We'll do a roll call. Amanda? Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Thank you, Ms. Rodman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Have Thanks. a good night. You as well. Thank you. Um, I see Mr. Cormier is here as well. Should we be looking to take some of those items out of order as well? Um, yes. Dr. Kavner? Yes, I think we would appreciate that very much. <laughs> um, so we have the lacrosse intent to travel as well as the football intent to travel. Please uh, please join us, Mr. Carmier. So new business please item B. Uh, oh, hello. Sorry, we have Dan Norton and Dan McLean, our coaches as well. Good evening. Hello. hello. Thanks for coming. <laughs> for the last hour, thanks for hanging out. <laughs> Very patient souls. Exactly. Okay. Mr. Kwame, would you tell us about the intent to travel for the boys lacrosse? Sure. Um, so it'll be a relatively short trip uh, right before uh, April vacation uh, where the team will travel down to Connecticut and uh, New York right over the, the state line. Um, they'll have a great opportunity to tour Yale, uh, attend a Yale lacrosse game, and then compete in a game against a team from New York. Uh, so it's a relatively quick trip, but a great team bonding trip, um, especially early in the season. I think it'll, it'll be really a good experience for them, both seeing the college game, being together for a weekend, having a chance to, to play a team from out of state. Uh, so I think it's just a great opportunity for them. Okay. That's great. Any questions? No, I think it's great. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, looking for a motion to approve the HHS Boys Lacrosse Intent to Travel for April 18th and 19th, 2020. So moved. Second. Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call vote. Amanda? Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Nancy? Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Thank you. Um, the next item, HHS Football Intent to Travel. Mr. Palmier. So again, very similar type situation, a little more involved um, in the sense that it's to Florida uh, instead of Connecticut and New York. Um, but the, Coach McLean has done a, a lot of background. Uh, the company that we're using or would be using is KSA Events. This is what they specialize in. Um, our volleyball team has gone to Florida, I believe, twice in the past uh, using the same company. Uh, I'm also familiar with it from my previous uh, employment at Foxborough, where our boys basketball team went down to Florida. Uh, as well uh, for a basketball tournament. Um, they are amazing at what they do in terms of really outlining everything from the transportation from here to the airport, from the airport to there, every little piece is done. Um, they actually even bring up a consultant uh, who, will, who will meet with the entire sort of football community to, to really go through uh, every little step uh, that this will involve. Um, and then from my point of view, again, similar to, to the boys across trip, this is just an amazing opportunity for these young men to, to travel together, really build a bond, uh, have an experience that they'll, they'll never forget, <coughs> uh, get to play a team down in Florida. Uh, this is part of our regular schedule. Uh, so this would count on our record. This would count towards everything. Uh, again, Coach has done a lot of research to make sure, you know, we're not going down playing some <laughs> Uh, team sending seven guys to Alabama, um, you know, so it's going to be a comparable uh, team that we're playing. Um, that would be interesting too. Uh, <laughs> um, and just again, I just think a terrific experience. Um, we do have one um, staff member on our football staff who's also a teacher here, um, but other than other than that particular coach, uh, the rest is are also all, all cops, I believe, police officers. Four out of the six. So yeah. very, we'll be very safe. Um, <laughs> On our travels, um, so we're, you know we're excited for this opportunity, um, you know, for for the program. 
That's great. I think it sounds great. If you need another chaperone, <laughs> I'll do the Florida trip. <laughs> Any other questions? I just had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Amanda, please. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think it all sounds great. The two things yeah. that concern me are the cost. It's very expensive for a large number of students. Um, and I have a student athlete, so I know that in addition to athletic fees, there's always an ask for, like, spirit wear. I mean, there's just sort of an ongoing trickle of money that we ask our athlete families to pay for various things throughout the season. Um, and it seems like a lot of money. So I have one concern about the money. I know there's some fundraising identified that will go on um but that's also a lot of pressure on the on the students to come up with that money so i don't know i guess this is a question for dr Kavanaugh if um financial aid applies to this kind of a trip for students who qualify so, and um so the other question i had was just the timing because i think the kids are missing what two days of school it looks like so um you know, again, I have seniors some certain sensitivities to this. Um, it's a time when they're doing college applications and school's just getting into a rhythm and it's two days of being away. So those are my two areas of concern. So so that you are correct. They'd be missing two days of school, and that's something that we, we certainly talked about. Um, <coughs> to have this, this opportunity, unfortunately, it was unavoidable uh, to be able to travel uh, to Florida and, and play the game. Um, it would be really difficult to do that where the game is on a Friday. Um, so it was something that, again, we kind of weighed uh, almost similar to a field trip that we just think this is experience, you know, worth missing school. Um, we certainly value school and the importance of, of being here. Um, but this is just one of those opportunities that I think is worth that. Uh, and then the financial piece is, is a valid point as well. Um, something That's something KSA also uh, is a huge help with in, in sort of streamlining the, the fundraising. And that's something that will be discussed uh, if this were approved and, and we had someone from KSA come up to speak about some of the different options to fundraise. Um, and no student would be obligated to go. Uh, for any reason, whether it was fear of flying uh, or, or financial cost or not wanting to miss school, they would not be held responsible or, or in any sort of negative way if they don't make the trip. Is this something that um, if, a, if a student required financial assistance, is this kind of a, a trip? Does that qualify? I think we're usually pretty good about finding ways okay. to assist students who have financial need. Yeah, if, if, if there was a player on the team, uh, and Coach and I have talked about this, that, that really wanted to to attend the trip, and for some reason money was an issue, it, that would not prevent okay. uh, okay. that student from we would attending. We, we would figure out a way to make sure that, that he's involved. 100%. Yeah, because I echo Amanda's. I mean, the, I think the whole thing sounds amazing, and I know the value of traveling with a group like this and, you know, the sort of bonding that goes on and the fact that there will be a lot of police, police officers there and a, and a bunch of high school kids sounds fantastic. But those are the two things. I know there's a lot of school missed in the fall where it's, you know, especially I was thinking about you have upperclassmen who are trying to figure out, sort some things out for the next year. And then um, the cost, those were the two things that jumped out at me too. I mean, for sure, it's an amazing experience. So just trying to weigh those two options, I think, you know, whatever we can do to minimize the impact on the kids, mm -hmm. I think it's I think mean, that's part of the reason, too, that we're trying to come forward. You, you know, like the lacrosse trip, obviously the cost uh, was not as significant, mm -hmm. so you need a little bit less lead time. And that's one of the reasons why we're coming so far in advance is so they have a, a good amount of time to, to raise this money. Okay. Any other questions? That's okay, great. Looking for a motion. Um, to approve the HHS football intent to travel for September 17th through 20th, 2020. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call mm -hmm. vote. Amanda? Amanda? I'm going to abstain. Okay. Aye. Meg? Yes. Yes. See, I'm a yes as well, so that's four yeses, so that passes with one abstention. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, thank and you. thank you, you for all the great thank work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're back to going through the agenda in order. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, your report. So tonight I have four things. Um, the Student Opportunity Act, we have a little bit more information about that, which I can share with you tonight, uh, just as usual, an enrollment update. 
Um, I thought I would give you a little bit of information about the statement of interest and the Mass School Building Authority um, that's coming up later on the agenda. What I'm really going to just share with you is I did some touring of Elmwood and I received some information from Mr. Person who's here if you have any questions for him as well, so I'll share that out now. Um, and then just a couple of little happenings in our schools. Uh, the two pictures you see on the front there, one is from the Martin Luther King Day celebration um, at the Mass Humane Center, and the top is the um, international night that we had at the high school. So I will be very honest with you and just let you know that these are really Commissioner Riley's slides. He sends them out to every district, and you get to see what he's putting forward. So I attended a, um, uh, a session with him on January 23rd, and this is what he gave to superintendents across the state. So what is the story with the Student Opportunity Act? Because we've all been sort of standing around waiting to see what was going to happen. Um, the Student Opportunity Act should provide a significant infusion of new funds with every district receiving at least some increase in Chapter 70, which we have. Um, as a result of this progressive school funding formula, and this one's the tricky part, only 35 districts are going to get 85% of the new money. So you're probably wondering, are we one of those districts? And the answer is no. <laughs> Um, in an effort to close persistent achieving achievement gaps, all the districts are required to submit a three-year evidence-based plan to the commissioner. And so what he has done is he has put together things that you can work on. So if you decide that you're going to sort of go with uh, the ones that he has offered, then it's much easier to just kind of get your plan put right through. And uh, the last one is you are um, – either going to fill out a short form, which is only two pages, and that's what most districts will get, or a long form, and we, thankfully, are a short form district. Um, so these are sort of the steps to all of this. Um, we have to determine what new programs are going to best reduce the disparities for our student subgroups. So really we'll have to look at, you know, data and student learning and, you know, experiences of the kids in our public schools and we will have to do number two where we invite parents and the community to engage in this process. Um, you have to have evidence that you have, in fact, in, engaged parents in the community in the process. Um, then you'll determine how the resources are going to be allocated, and then you will also determine, number four, how you're going to measure your success in improving student performance. Uh, essentially, the way that works is that the chair of the school committee and I are sort of spearheading this. So what they're trying to do is make it, you know, very easy to make good choices. And as I had said, the commissioner is going to have sort of this menu from which you can choose. And if you choose them, it gets very easy to do this. Uh, so some of the things that, you know, he's looking at, you know, he said, so you're adopting two to three of his priorities. So if you look at the three that are offered, they have full day, high quality pre-K for all four-year-olds and evidence-based early literacy. That's something that we already have here in Hopkinton. Um, <clears throat> Increased percentage of high school students enrolled in early college. That's really not something that we currently have here in Hopkinton, although you know that Carla Christopoli has been working with um, Mass Bay and you know, trying to kind of grow that CBTE program. Um, but the third one, recruitment and retention strategies to, to diversify the educator and administrator workforce, well, that's something that's been on our radar for a very long time. And we have had not had market success in you know, hiring people who are um, – you know, different from all of the, the majority of the teachers in our district. Uh, you can, in fact, submit a program outside of the menu, but then the commissioner will need to review your, your plan. Here's a timeline for what this will look like. Uh, they did tell us that uh, they were going to be in this, getting us the plan templates in January. It did come the first Monday in March. Uh, but now we're going to be working with local stakeholders to develop our plans. And uh, Desi will support us with any technical assistance that we need. And local school committees are going to need to vote on those plans before they get submitted back to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Our plan is due on April 1st. If they don't like it, you'll know, but in May and June. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you have any questions about the Student Opportunity Act. Just, just for clarification, regardless of whether we qualify for funds from this new thing, 
we still have to put a plan together. Everybody will qualify. You could have this much fund or this much fund, but but yes, everybody does have to do a plan. Okay. Yeah. That's what we're doing this much for, for this much. Well, that's kind of, I mean, right. <laughs> right. A lot of people have said that. Yes. yes. When I went to that workshop, you know, and they did the who's going to be in the short form, and they picked a couple of districts to illustrate Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we made the short form. And we'll be discussing this uh, or, or hearing more about this with Senator Spilka. We will, yes. Thank week. you for saying that. Uh, Mina and I, are you going as well, are going to um, send Senator Spilka's office on Monday. She's doing something to kind of get us started with this process, so that's really great. Any of you guys going? Yeah. You, uh, no, I will be at work. Working. <laughs> How about Amanda? Amanda? Are you going on Monday? Can't hear you. Senator Spilkes. Yes. Yes, yes. I will. Right. <coughs> All right. Uh, so as of Friday, January 31st, we had 3,911 students in the district. Uh, it looks like uh, we're. I think Georgette did the in-out migration for me today. Uh, currently, our net increase, if you can see that yellow bar down at the bottom, is 184 students since June 15th. So that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. This 184 is against the projected 103. Is that right? 103 oh, or 104? Yeah, right. that's correct. Yes. Thank you. And I appreciate it. I think. Did your, was it an email from you, Dr. Kavanaugh, that talked about how 10 students showed up at Hopkins with, very yeah. recently? Yes. Like just in that one January. school, yes. we had 10 yes. students. Since the new year. So I think that's a, that's a, that was a very powerful email just to say, hey, guess what? Since January, 10 more kids showed up in Hopkins. Right? It, it definitely helps reinforce that we did the right thing by putting those classrooms on that school. Modular oh, yes. Classrooms. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Kavanaugh, are you able to comment a little bit on the exiting the ninth grade? Um, and also even yeah. the first private grade. Schools. I would think private, private it's schools. going away to private school and high school. What about first school. grade? The the 17 students who left it from yes. first grade? Yes. Yeah, it, it's hard to know. I mean, those just could be students who moved. You know, it's just hard to know. It, it's interesting because you have 17 who are leaving, but you also had 40, 42 who came in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, anecdotally, I, I, a lot of families will move when their kids before they get to a certain point. Yeah, I think as well if they know they're going to make a move. All right, I did want to thank all of the voters who got out there and voted for the high school classroom and the modulars at both Elmwood and Hopkins. Um, as you can see by the numbers in the previous slide, we are really going to need those classrooms. So uh, we are grateful to those folks. All right, so the Elmwood SOI. Um, many people have said, you know, why are we submitting a statement of interest for um, the Elmwood School? If you look at the last yellow sentence up there, we have submitted statements of interest for Elmwood to the MSBA several times. We did it in 2008, 12, 13, 17, 18, and 19. Each one of those times, the MSBA has said no. Um, we do think that that is our neediest school. Uh, we think that it, it may not be the oldest school, but it is certainly, we think, our neediest school. So these are some of the things that uh, make Elmwood our neediest school. So it was built in 1964. It's currently our second oldest building, but I would argue that it is the building that is in the worst condition of all five. Um, it is built on a Tennessee gas line. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we were going back and forth about about that gas line. Mm -hmm. um, there is still a significant amount of asbestos in that building. Um, Mr. Person, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that any of the asbestos has been re removed from Elmwood. Correct. Yeah. Um, the windows in that building will open, but they don't have screens. And my understanding is that there is no screen that would fit those windows. So I mean, that's, that's all well and good, except for when it's September or it's June. And what the teachers would like to do is to be able to leave the windows open overnight because it cools the classrooms down. But now that we're in you know, an era of triple E, they can't do this. If you keep the windows open during the school day and you know, you've got bees in there, you've got 
Man. 22nd graders were all like, Wah! and that's, that's just really unfortunate, I'll say. Um, the cafeteria currently is very overcrowded. I think that the capacity of that, build, of that room is about 196, and I think we have seats in there for 216 students. But we spread them out over four lunch periods, so we're not in violation of any fire codes. Um, but I think that makes things tough, because the first <laughs> lunch happens you know, just at 11 o'clock, and you know, kids have walked through the door just before just 9. So you know, there's a lot of, I think, interruption in the way of teaching and learning, because now I need snack, I'm very hungry. You know, that kind of thing goes on all day. Uh, the play area out back is way too small to accommodate our current enrollment, never mind our future enrollment. So what we've been doing is letting the kids go out and play on the big field, but then when it snows, they end up playing on the plowed driveway with, you know, cones stretch across to let traffic know they can't pull in there while the kids are out playing. Uh, Elmwood is tough because it's that geographical outlier, which you saw in the transportation um, presentation. We currently have two modulars. We will be adding four. There's not another inch in terms of the footprint that you could put another modular on. And in addition to all of the modulars now that are kind of connected, uh, there's some pretty serious parking restrictions. So people who had a second grader last year, for example, uh, if you tried to go to second grade steam night last night and you weren't there 30 minutes early, you probably parked so far away that by the time you walked, all of the events were over. Uh, we do have a terrible parking problem. Uh, there are electrical shortcomings, there's technology limitations, and we are in desperate need of office space. There have been different studies done in the district. So we have a study that was done in 2007, and again, there was a Habib report um, in 2012. At that time, that report indicated that the Elmwood School needed $6.5 million in repairs. And I think to date, and Mr. Person can correct me again if I'm wrong, we've done about $2 million of those repairs. Is that since 2012? Yes. Yeah. So in 2016, they put a roof on. Uh, we did uh, a big project with exhaust fans last year. Uh, 20, oh, oil was installed in 2010. Um, so there's been a lot of work done to keep that building going. But it, there's a lot left to do when it continue to run that in its, in its current condition. Thank you. A question, just since you mentioned the modulars up there, the, the two modulars that are there, I, I mm. believe, are about 15 years old. Is that about right? Or 12, 14. 12, 14. Okay, not, not a bad guess. No. Uh, what is the life expectancy of those? Um, 20. <laughs> oh, just, I was guessing we were. Yeah, so we are closing in on the life expectancy of those. Although. That's not saying that they're going to fall apart. No, I, I know, but I'm just thinking longer range. But there will be there, some, some maintenance that's going to to go along with that as they get older. Um, Susan and I were talking earlier, the roof, roofs are probably going to need to be done sometime in the next five to ten years on them. The rooftop units that heat and cool those two classrooms may need to be done. So, um, and even in this project, we're looking at replacing the emergency uh, stairs as they <coughs> lasted their useful life on, on that already. And so, oops, can I just really... Uh, I think that this is really important because, for example, Center School, mm. our maintenance and custodial department did an amazing job at keeping a building that was essentially falling apart running. And, you know, granted, the back of Center School was built in 1950-something and not 1960-something, but let's plus or minus 10 years here. We get out of that school for two years, and it's essentially ruined. Yeah. The flow, everything's, I mean, the flow, everything's ruined. Mm -hmm. So I think it speaks volumes as to the quality of our custodial maintenance department, but I feel like, you know, if we, if we reflect that point onto Elmwood right now, you're, you're band-aiding it together mm -hmm. to hold it together. And I think if, if a building falls apart two years after you stop using it, that's a huge indication of how rough shape it was in. So I think it's important for people to really understand that you're holding it together. Yeah. Like we held center school together, but it's not going to stay together for, forever. And I, I think that's an important thing that everybody needs to know. Yeah. So, you know, a good example is this carver bought those really big sort of floor to ceiling kind of 
bulletin boards last year. And to save money on the paper, she went in and asked every teacher, what color do you want? And they're painted beautiful bright colors like turquoises and yellows and pinks and greens. And you walk through that school and it's a lovely experience. You know, children don't realize that the infrastructure is as bad as it is. Right. So right. we are holding it together. Yeah. Thank you. You are. You are. Yep. But I, I mean, if it's going to fall apart I don't in two have years, what's to do with holding yeah. it together? So here's just the footprint of that first floor, and I think it's it's a little bit interesting. Up in the upper left hand corner, you can see we have 14 first floor classrooms. If you look at that. Um, thing that says computer lab that's a room that's off of the library it's no longer a computer lab because we don't really need one any longer um, with one-to-one -one devices although that's not a one-to-one -one school yet but that's a shared special education space so if you go in there you can have multiple kids being taught sort of under the same roof at the same time uh, then we have the uh, cafeteria that is 1930 square feet it's undersized for that building my my least favorite part i think of the building is if you look at all those little chopped up spaces those things at one time were classrooms but now they're chopped up into little spaces so that you have space for um, intensive special needs you have a space for guidance you have a space for speech and um, language you have a space for the school adjustment counselor dysregulated children so all of that happens in those tiny little places that we've carved up uh, when that building was originally built, I believe the library was the original gym, and then the gym was added on to become a new gym. So dismissal happens way down where the gym is, but the bus queues up way up. So our kids are actually, you know, kind of hoofing it up there. Not that I have any problem with children walking to the bus, but that's one of the reasons dismissal takes so long. So because dismissal takes so long, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we stop instruction five minutes or ten minutes early every day to get make sure our kids are on that bus. Um, You've all seen that special education space that is also a book storage space. <laughs> it's up on the top right. To get into that space, you either need to go through um, a regular gen ed classroom or the art room. There is no hallway space that will take you in there. And then finally, those two things you see on the, on the right-hand side are the modular classrooms. The one on the top is the one where there is shared L space. And I'll just very quickly walk you through some of the pictures. So these are some instructional spaces at the Elmwood School. You can see a table and chair set up on the 300 square foot stage in the cafetorium. You can see that PT and OT are in a split room that's kind of above the gym. I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's a line that goes down the ceiling where you can pull kind of a uh, flexible wall across. So there are two doors there. And if the camera went out further, you'd see that there are two doors on either side. So if you have a student who's a bolter, that's a very bad spot for, to be delivering physical oh, yeah. therapy and occupational therapy. Uh, you also see that there's a table and chairs at the top of that stairwell, right in the hallway, next to the recycling bin. Instruction happens in that space as well. Uh, here's a very interesting thing. We had a student who was a climber. And he is a student who can attend to learning if he is with the person that he is sort of his trusted instructor. And he does very well without any of those distractions. Well, we have cut up so many spaces that there are no more small spaces. So that had to be built for that child in a classroom. Um, on top, you can see that there's that shared English learner classroom. What you see there is the cloth divider. On the other side, another person teaches. And in the forefront, you can see that there is a table for four, and that's speech and language. That room is, I think, 11 by 10, we measured it. So you've got about 110 <coughs> square feet in there. It's smaller than a horse stall. Just mm -hmm. throw that out there. It's smaller than a horse's stall. <laughs> <laughs> it is smaller than a horse's yes. stall. Uh, storage space and special education instruction all happens in one room. So at the top, you can see stacks and stacks of leveled readers. You can see a teacher's desk and workspace. You can see a place for math and reading instruction in that room. You can imagine how distracting it is when you've got bunches of kids learning multiple things, taught by multiple teachers under the same roof. Now we get to heating and cooling. These are four different spaces. And it was just you know something that I kind of picked up on as I walked through. So you can see that Mrs. Carver's hand is on that univent. When you go into that conference room, and there's only one conference room in the building, if it's cold, you turn that univent on, but it gets very warm very quickly. So you can see that there's a window just above the univent, so you open the window and turn the univent on at the same time, 
and you'll get something that is a little bit climate controlled. And if it's very warm in there, you can just abandon both of those two things and go straight to the air conditioner that you see in the top right. In the middle, bottom center, that's a space heater. That's in a very frigid room. Um, the upper left, when I went into that room, it was about 84 degrees, and the teacher has to crack all of those windows, again, to keep it kind of climate controlled because it's very hot in that room. And in the bottom left, you can see that we have a, a vent. It's kind of rusted there, but what's happened over time from all that moisture is that wood is very rotted there as well. So we do have some heating and cooling problems. And I guess when we think about that four and a half million dollars, these are the kinds of things that would need to be corrected. I mean, it's not so different from what we had at center school. That was exactly yeah, what I, I, I was, was, was going to say. I thought I won't say it again. Yeah. Similar. It is yeah. dramatically similar. Uh, yes. Particularly Thank with you. regard to the uh, creative ways that heating and cooling are happening, in which are not efficient for um, yes. our tax dollars. That's yeah. right. The, the other piece that you can draw your attention to, the, the one that has the space heater behind it, you can see all the electrical cords. Oh. I that is another that. issue that we really have, which is just the inadequacy of um, electric infrastructure. And you can see that right there in that picture right. when we're talking about HVAC. <laughs> Are you ready for some really ele bad electrical problems? Oh, maybe I didn't put it in. Oh, I don't think I did. So there's a, a great picture of um, the data room. And because you don't want to disrupt any of the asbestos, about 9 million cords. When I say that, I mean a, a huge batch of cords, like I'd wrap my arms around it, kind of all just come out of a ceiling and into. I should have taken that picture. It was absolutely great. It seems to me there were issues with the um, room. It, the, it center school had a room like that. Mm -hmm. Next thing, just the happenings in our schools. Uh, I, I know this is, might be painful, but I think because uh, all of these kids were able to um, very delightfully win these Scholastic Art Awards, I mean, it's such a tribute to our art teachers and to the children themselves. So uh, I will read uh, Joshua Blangard, Emma Lucy, Aditya Vadyanathan, Cindy Yang, Hope DeLuca, Madeline Mezit, Casey Torigny, um, Manor Hader, Emmer Hansen, Linnea Pappas Byers, Soleil Randall, uh, Lily Vaughn, Lillian Gallagher, Audrey Johnson, and Grace Lasada. So I didn't read them if they won for multiple things, and we had many students who won for multiple things. Uh, the other thing that you see over on that side, you can see some pictures of some students working in a classroom. I just want to make you aware that Mrs. Janino is now sending out a newsletter, Hop Art Headlines, and it's fabulous. You're going to love it. So this is her uh, first issue coming out shortly. Uh, just a couple other things. On Saturday, January 25th, Visions training happened with the Youth Commission and the school committee uh, sponsoring it, and Youth and Family Services was also there. Uh, from the picture on the front of the Martin Luther King Day celebration at the Mass Humane Center, uh, HHS International Night, we had various clubs at Hopkinton High School celebrating culture and diversity, and tomorrow morning there is a tech legislative breakfast um, with the Education Collaborative in Dedham. And last amazing things, we have Karen Tang, who's our eighth grade student. Um, she is representing the middle school at Project 351. And Hopkins is going to be starting their random acts of kindness. And I've got nothing else for you. That's, That's quite a bit, actually. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Well, any questions for Dr. Kavanaugh? Amanda, from you? OK, it sounded like a no. I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No, no, that's great. Okay, great. Thank Moving you. on to the next item on the agenda. <coughs>
the SC Chair Report. I have approved payroll warrants numbers 20015, number S2016A, and number S20016. The warrants have been included in your packet. I have also approved warrant numbers 20-037, 20-038, and 20-040. All those warrants have also been included in your packet. I have some other <coughs> updates that I'd like to share. Um, um, we've been meeting quite regularly on the Budget Advisory Committee, and I've been excited about that. There's a good, um, there's very good information sharing that's happening. So we're meeting on a weekly basis. Um, the town manager and the town CFO have shared information on revenue sources, uh, the one-time HCA monies. Uh, that is due to us, and some thoughts on the overall deficit that uh, that we have. And since the feasibility study is in front of us this year, there have been good conversation on the MSBA process, um, the long-term plans, um, and the long-term borrowing associated with that, the bond rating impact, all of these conversations have been happening. And both Dr. Uh, Kavanaugh and Ms. Rothmick obviously is, uh, you know, they've been talking as well. So if there is any information that any member is seeking, <coughs> I would request them to reach out to Dr. Kavanaugh or Ms. Rothmick. Um, also, Dr. Kavanaugh forwarded an invite to Hopkinton 101 event, which is scheduled uh, for April 4th, Saturday, um, 10 to 2 p.m. in the past, <coughs> I think in the last year we did a, um, a booth or something. A, a office yeah. hours, right? So perhaps we can consider that again. Um, and, and, you know, one of the challenges I had expressed is the information is not coming to the school committee directly from the town <coughs> uh, when certain boards are included uh, for invites. So I've been thinking about where the gap is, where the break is happening. and. I was wondering, uh, you know, what is it that we could do on our end to get on the mailing list on the town side where they have all boards and all chairs, uh, email IDs. So I reached out to Mr. Ghosh and asked him if we could create a generic email uh, for, let's say, the chair, and if we can get that included along with the entire school committee on town mailing list. So they have some multiple mailing lists on their end where they have the chairs and then there is one which is all leadership. So I feel like we should request that we be added there. And if we just give them the generic one, as changes happen, they can be managed on our end. That's a good idea. Right? Yeah. There's so, a lot of boards that have just a chair yeah. email. Yeah, right. which makes sense. Yeah. Right. So perhaps go forward with that. So that was one thought. Um, and hopefully this will keep it simpler. We will have to wait and see. Right. The other thought along those lines um, in terms of, you know, when I reached out to Mr. Ghosh, I also asked him if we could include the HPS school committee email on the listserv on any of the generic messages that go out. This might help current and future school committee members who may not have children in the district to receive communication that is shared throughout the district. Mm -hmm. If, if that's okay mm -hmm. with the school committee, I'd like us to proceed with yeah, just those two sense. actions. Mm -hmm. um, we also received an annual conflict of interest certification, again, um, through Dr. Kavanaugh, which came from the town clerk's office. So hopefully all of us will fill that out. Um, we kind of have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I believe an email is just good. Uh, we also have an invite as Dr. Kavanaugh shared from the Senate President's office to attend lunch and discussion in the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, I hope you'll all be able to join. I think we heard Amanda and Nancy are able to join, and mm -hmm. you're not able to join. Uh, but we'll hopefully bring some good information back. And Dr. Kavanaugh and I um, discussed this a little bit, uh, where she also talked earlier about the um, SOA plan. We are looking to discuss the plan for our district following the meeting, and we'll bring it back to the committee. Um, a community member wrote to share the current aftercare providers' billing policies and to consider these as a factor when reviewing potential providers. Um, another update I have is uh, Representative Dykema reached out about reinstating the regional Metro West Innovation Group. 
And if there is anyone on the committee who is interested, you know, she offered through her office to reach out to all the chairs and members in the districts, in the regional district, to um, reinstate that round table. And you know, Nancy, both you and Amanda were part of it in the past. So if there's an interest. It really only met once, and then it fell. I mean, that, that was some of the frustration with it, was that it, it, it just didn't have the steam. Right, going forward. Right. So she was, you know, we had talked about it because I feel regionally there is so much you can do and discuss in terms of policy. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, meeting every month. It could be once a quarter even. Right. And you get together with colleagues around. So someone needs to lead it, but her office is willing to coordinate it. So if there is any interest in that, we can reach back to her if any one of you is interested now or later well it's not that I'm not interested it's just a question of when it happens you know if if it happens during the work day then I'm, unfortunately I wouldn't no, be able to do true. it but right. but yeah it'd be it's interesting, interesting yeah. right I think so too I had attended one of the earliest conversations around it I thought that was a great concept to talk about innovation and learn from surrounding districts what's going on um, and, and also talking about policy what's working what's not working what can we learn from one another right uh, so not just wait for the MASC conference right. which I think is great but also do something year-round um, so if there are no takers at the moment perhaps at the next meeting if anyone has any thoughts I'd be happy to and if she has any thoughts on when she might hold it that would be helpful to be able yeah. to say yes or no too that we could attend sure i think she's just looking for one of us Generally. you know she asked me okay. if i'd be willing to lead it i'm just opening it up uh, okay, to the rest okay. of the committee okay also um, a middle school student reached out to me to interview me as part of his boy scouts project mm -hmm. he wanted to know about my role why i decided to run for school committee what's the work like on school committee etc it's part of his communication goals, and he has expressed an interest in attending a future school committee meeting mm. to see how we make decisions. That was, that was pretty That's neat. Great. Great. I asked him a few questions, too. No. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's working, and what would he want to be different? He was actually yeah. very excited about all the things that are going on. He was most excited about the robotics program mm. in middle school. Mm. And he wanted a bigger break time. <laughs> uh, if only we can make that happen, right? Um, I also attended the community communications group meeting after a long time. Uh, and the annual nonprofits and government organizations meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, February 27th. So all of you are invited. I think it's, a, it's doing very well. I think Jim Cousins HCAM is doing a great job this year as the chair. Um, also, I attended and learned from the Visions training spearheaded by Nancy and Don Ronan. So, I love that. Um, that's all I have for my report. That's good. Liaison, or, oh, before we move on to liaison reports, I think we have another one. The school committee <laughs> annual report. I was not able to get it in time to get into the packet, but I'd share it if there are any thoughts from anyone to make any changes. Okay. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. How about you, Amanda? She's shaking her head now. Okay. It's good. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, so off that'll go. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, moving on to the next item, liaison reports. I have one quick one. Um, policy we kind of <coughs> talked about, but um, uh, Growth Study Committee met earlier this week, and uh, John Westerling from the DPW came to talk about <laughs> exciting things like water and sewer, um, but he also talked about traffic, which I think directly mm -hmm. affects the school. Um, and um, so they're thinking about gathering data on uh, traffic counts on different in different points in the town. Um, also, DPW st staffing in terms of snow removal, um, and how if any of us have driven past the DPW lately, there's a sign out front that says like snow contractors wanted. Mm -hmm. So, um, were you uh, looking at me intentionally? Because I because I think you should throw your plow in front of snow your car. Contract. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You're showing interest. <laughs> um, and also sidewalks because I think that was also something that we affects the schools and um, evidently we have 30 plus miles of sidewalks in town 
Um, and so one of the tricky things for them that may affect us as school, the schools is that first <coughs> the, the contractors go out and plow the roads, and after doing that for 9 or 10 or 11 hours, then they hop in the little tiny mini snow blowers mm -hmm. and hit the sidewalks that are not part of the, you know, if, you, if you, you're supposed to shovel the sidewalk out in front of your... So, so yeah. some of these folks are out there for, you know, 14, 15, 16 hours. <coughs> and um, so anyway, it, it, the more sidewalks we add, the more of a challenge it becomes was sort of the, the point of that one. Um, and then the last piece that, again, affects us in a sort of roundabout way is the um, economic development officer that the um, growth study committee feels pretty strongly is a good idea, um, is hoping anyway. They, they presented at the select board on Tuesday and I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to go and I don't know the results of that and if anybody was able to attend select board meeting, but um, there was a concern that it wasn't being going to be well received, so I hope that wasn't the case. I don't know if that was the case, but I think, um, you know, it's something that would alleviate some of the stress on residential income, or residential property taxpayers um, if we had an increased commercial tax base to work with. So the hope is that, um, we could get this officer in place sooner rather than later. It's a tough budget year, so it might not be this year. But Ashland has had huge success with their economic development officer, and she's done an amazing job there bringing commercial growth into Ashland. Um, they brought up Marlboro as a great example of a place where an economic development officer, and it's not so different geographically from, you know, 495, 90. So anyway, I think all these things, you know, they, they're hoping that, we can generate some support, support for this so that the burden of all of our increased costs as a result of our growth might be borne a, a little bit more by the spread. Commercial, yeah, exactly. I was actually there at the select board meeting. How did it go? I, I think it went well. I think it was a very good conversation. Yeah. I thought there were a lot of thoughts. I think people were giving it good thought. Of course, there are those aspects where, you know, we are not ready to be Marlboro. I am not, too. Right. And so those were some of the things that were talked about. Uh, but I think one of the things uh, I thought Amy Ritterbush and uh, Fran Leo, mm -hmm. and there was uh, another person, I forget his name. I don't know who else went. So, um, so he was also there, and I thought they did a very good job of presenting. Finn, the, the, sorry, Brennan. Finn. Yes, Finn, yes, yes. Yeah. He, he was great too, and and so I think they all had um, you know some aspects to contribute to, and so where we are at eighty three seventeen percent, you know, um, personal property tax versus industrial commercial. There was a conversation: could we shift to eighty twenty, and perhaps eventually to seventy thirty? So there was a lot of conversation around that, but there were also concerns expressed that do we really have space mm -hmm. identified and earmarked where we could have commercial establishments outside of South Street, right? So where are those places? So I thought the board brought excellent mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas, cool. and I thought it was a good conversation. It's to be seen where we move. Of course, there was this conversation about it's going to cost us, uh, you know, whatever is the salary of this person, how will that Player. Right, right. Again, a very good conversations. I feel like we are all, all of this is so tied in, mm -hmm. the money aspects of it. I mean, money is needed, revenues are needed, and how do you generate that, right? Good. Yeah. Now, thank you, Jen, for that update. I think the Growth Study Committee is doing a great job. Yeah, they are. It's a, it's a great group. Yeah, thank you for serving on it. Absolutely. Nancy. Do you have any updates? I don't have anything. How can you say that? The visions training. That was well, so you fabulous. Gave that. You, no, you gave that update. I just that said that I just attended it. I thought that was great. Tell us about it. I don't Tell the community. It. <laughs> it was a great uh, training on you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was also it was a, a nice to have the opportunity to work alongside some of our um, town partners. So that I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a good group of people. Mm -hmm. I certainly learned a lot. I thought that was fabulous and um, opens your eyes to so much that you don't realize. And I hope we can bring that back as a discussion topic. You know, we mm -hmm. spent five times five plus Dr. Kavanaugh plus another administrative team member. You know, 25 hours of the school committee members' time, man hours. So if we can, or women hours, if we can bring <laughs> bring it back and say, you know, what is it that we have learned? How could we conduct some of our business differently, having learned some of it, um, I think that will be a good conversation to have. 
I thought there were some very specific tools uh, that I took away. So it was great. Yes. Thank you so much for doing that. I enjoyed it. Any other updates? Amanda, do you have any updates on any of the liaison reports? No. She can't hear you. She doesn't. She doesn't. No. She's shaking her head. Okay. All right. So we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Office hours. I know um, Amanda has made a couple of suggestions uh, for upcoming for this month. One is over this weekend. Um, the game. The game. Is anyone interested in, I know this is short notice, uh, but I think there was also one towards the end of the month. Amanda, are you able to speak to that at all? Or do you want me to? Okay, yep. The, the, originally, I think we had talked about maybe doing um, office hours in conjunction with the basketball game because mm -hmm. they tend to draw a lot of residents. Tomorrow night it will be a um, probably very well attended game. I'm not sure. It might be too well attended. It's the senior night, and I think they're welcoming Mr. Keene back. Yep. It's also Coaches for Cancer. Um, so that was one of the dates, but it was sort of before I knew all the details around the night. So I'm not sure tomorrow is a great option. Um, the other dates had to do more with Music in Our Schools Month in March. And then we have our choice of where we want to go. I mean, the concerts kind of move around around the, the um, district. So... We could go to a Hopkins concert, or we could go to a high school concert, or jazz night, or um, so whatever people are interested in. Any preference from anyone? Nancy, you're looking. I am. Time. I'm looking at my calendar. I am not able to go tomorrow night. I'm sure there would well, be I one of the. I don't think we can go yeah, anyway because we can't post in right. time. Well, sure. well, but if we we typically sure. do two at a time. People there at a time anyway. Oh, we do office right. hours, but. It's very short notice. It's very short notice for the community. Right. And I think Amanda's right. There's a lot going on tomorrow yeah. that, I mean, it would be. people would, would, might walk right by us to get to right. one of the other things that are going on. It's, yeah, there's, yep. it's a big night for And I know the vacation break is coming up, so how about March to, um, you know, March mm -hmm. music one? Is there any one particular one that we want to just zero in on? Any school? We want to try middle school, Hopkins? So the thing to, just to keep in mind with the middle school and Hopkins is those are grade specific so we're only capturing one grade if we're there on those nights okay I, I mean presumably people could come out for that we're not going to the concert but I think because of the parking constraints mm -hmm. people tend not to <coughs> go out to the schools on the nights of another concert mm -hmm. um, That's the high point. school does ca capture four, four grades. grades but I'm not sure it's more students I don't know. I, I, maybe we could do more than one since we're not all going to be there. We right. Could do teams of a couple of us do one night and a couple of us do another. I mm -hmm. like that idea. That yeah, might that. that might work. Oh. I'm up for yeah, I think, Go ahead. Sorry, I think I have the dates of uh, March 10th is Hopkins. March 17th is grade 6. March 18th is grade 7. March 24th is... Uh, Grade 8 band and chorus and grade 7 and 8 orchestra. And March 26th is the high school. So it's 10th, 17th, 18th, 24th, or 26th. We have a lot of choices. The, the cha they did change the Hopkins concert to the 16th. Okay. Um, I can't remember why, but there was a reason. Oh, wait, I could okay. be lying to you. <laughs> Okay. It's on both dates. I don't know. So we could figure that out, out offline. offline. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. So, but if we just agree to, you know, doing Hopkins and middle school, I think that helps. And we can yep. just figure out the dates and who's going. Right? Yep. Okay, that sounds good. And then we can just let folks know. All right. Yep. Th thank you, Amanda and everyone. Yep. Thanks. All right. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, new business. Uh, vote to ratify cafeteria workers memorandum of agreement, Dr. Kavno. So, as you may know, <laughs> we've been in, I shouldn't say we have been, this is Rodemick and Mrs. Polnick, um, and our food service director, Michelle Babin, have been in negotiations with the cafeteria workers for a very, very long time. I know that you were able to review the MOU, so I am recommending that you approve that um, contract between um, you and the Association of Cafeteria Workers, uh, which will actually be retroactive to July 1st, 2019. Looking for a motion as outlined in um, so moved. the agenda. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. I didn't know if we had to call, you know, call this out, perhaps. 
No, I'd do it just in case because it's, it's, oh, it's, yes. it's, 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 it's people's yep. paycheck, um, so let's call it right. out. Right. Yeah. Looking for a motion to approve the Association of Cafeteria Workers of Hopkinton, SEIU, Local 888, Memorandum of Agreement for the period of July 1st, 2019, through and including June 30th, 2022. So moved. Second. A motion by Nancy, second by um, Meg. We're going to do a roll call vote. Amanda? Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Nancy? Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Thank you Great. so much, Dr. Kavanaugh, Ms. Rothermick, <coughs> and Ms. Polnick. Well, you should really thank Mrs. Rothermick, Ms. Polnick, and Michelle Babin because <laughs> they negotiated for a very, very long time. That's a long time. A long time. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, since we already covered items B and C under new business, we move on to item D, Elmwood School Gift Account. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, they should go pretty quickly. Um, I am recommending that the school committee accept a box top check in the amount of $411.10 for the Elmwood School Gift Account. Looking for a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by uh, Meg. Roll call vote. Amanda? She said aye. 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 We aye. need to hear it. Aye, thank you. Uh, Meg? Aye. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Um, the next item, item E, Alnwood School Gift Account, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so Sherry from the Hawkington Chinese Association, the HCAA, got in touch with me and Mrs. Carver, and they would very much like to donate $200 to the Elmwood School Gift Account. Looking for motions? So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call vote, Amanda. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Many thanks to the HCAA and also all those people who mm -hmm. cut those box tops diligently. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, item F, Elmwood Statement of Interest, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, so I would like to submit a statement of interest again to the Mass School Building Authority um, for the Elmwood School. And um, I think you have a lot of information about that, and it would be about our seventh or eighth time doing that. Um, just to be clear, when, when you do this, you'll go through that process of eligibility, feasibility, so you will do an entire feasibility study. What I am recommending is that we pull the feasibility study out of our capital asks right now. Um, I feel like if we're not going to be invited in until December and then you have to go through a 90-day period of eligibility, uh, we are probably smarter to just look for that feasibility study um, after we are invited in and sort of the ball gets rolling and we have a much better sense of sort of what we're looking at there. Um, you know that we had the capacity study done. They did drawings of a 2-3 school and a 4-5 school on that same plot of land. They did a drawing of a combined 2-3-4-5 school on that plot of land. Um, this will just be a way for the MSBA to review our ask and say whether or not it's something that they would want to support. I also know that there's a whole lot of concern about what's going to happen on this side of Hayden Rose Street. So when you submit to the MSBA and you submit for Elmwood, it does not impact in any way, shape, or form what the configuration looks like on this side of the road. And there may be people who say, well, what will you do? Um, what, what I would say is this. If we are building a two to five school and Hopkins becomes vacant, you've got Hopkins, the current middle school, and the high school, um, which is an awful lot of space to make decisions about what you want to do. And I know people might be saying, oh my gosh, how can you do that willy-nilly without a decision in hand right now? If we get invited in in December of 2020, the door to that new school will probably not open until at the earliest August of 2025. Uh, so probably somewhere around 2023, you have the options to say, okay, so the predictions about enrollment, are they coming true or are they not coming true? And it's going to help guide the community about what you want to do with all of the real estate that you have here. But the real estate that you have is certainly enough to accommodate kids in grades 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Because currently it's accommodating kids in 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you have eight portable classrooms that you could be moving to this location if you absolutely had to do that. Right. So you've got that. I guess I would just caution people not to get very worried about this, and here's why. When I'm with the town CFO, he looks at this through a financial lens, and he says, oh my gosh, how much would it cost if you had to put an enormous addition onto the Hopkins School? 
but we don't know if that is accurate yet or not. And then when I'm with people in town, they will say, I don't think I would like to have an 8-9 academy. And I say, well, that is something that a community is going to decide somewhere down the road. Right. And then there are times when people will say, I would love to turn Hopkins into a 6, 7, 8 school. And I say, that's not for me to decide. It's for a community to decide down the road. But I'm encouraging you to vote in the affirmative for me to be able to at least submit to the, this SOI to the MSBA, because I feel like if we don't do something, there's no opportunity for us to get any reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And as I said in my first presentation, I, I believe that that is the school that affords us the greatest opportunity to get reimbursement, and also to replace something that's struggling. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I welcome the um, thought that we're going to hold off on the feasibility study, and you know, we've been talking about it for a while now, that um, you know, given where we are with everything, um, we need to get into it with a known risk of not being reimbursed, and I think that's, that's fiscally responsible action to take on that front. Um, on the statement of interest, um, I think it makes sense. We've been doing this for a while now. Um, I do think that you know we have some other items coming uh, down on the agenda where we will talk a little bit about what are some of the conversations that need to happen. Now, in terms of you know what you have shared with us is simply a sample. It's not the exact language. Is that something that you're looking for us to approve? Um, yes, so if we are approving this, this has to be read verbatim, and uh -huh. it suggests that we would be submitting this SOI on February 28th, 2020, because when it leaves here, it also has to go to the Board of Selectmen, mm -hmm. and the minutes of each meeting have to be submitted and pr produced and submitted along with the okay. statement of interest. So what we have in the packet, is that the one? Uh, I have a typed copy that actually fills sure. in all of the data. Thank you. So you, want me to pass this along? you can. That's surely it. Just has to be read verbatim. Whoever is going to make the motion. Sure. Uh, if anyone wants to look at it, and I don't know how we get this to Amanda. And I don't know if um, are the folks had any thoughts on um, this particular item and what Dr. Kaplan shared. No, I'm in full agreement. I think we need, we've, we've <laughs> submitted this SOI six times. I can't remember how many dates were up there, but I think we need to continue to submit because if it was a need in 2008, it's 2020, right. it's still a need. So we got to submit. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Totally so, agree. So if you say, I'm seeking a motion to, and then you read this, okay, we can uh -huh. say so moved in second. Yeah. Um, just checking with Amanda as well. Yeah, I, I think we definitely should submit this SOI. I think, to everyone's point, we've done this um, over and over, and I think we have to keep trying. So um, I'm, I'm all in favor of submitting this. I have other comments for, you know, later in the, um, in the other agenda items, but it's not relevant to the SOI. I'm, I'm all in favor. Okay. Um, I'm seeking a motion to approve the SOI to be submitted to the MSBA as follows. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on February 6, 2020, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the Hopkinton School Committee of Hopkinton, Massachusetts, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated February 28, 2020, for the Elmwood Elementary School located at 14 Elm Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Categories 2, 4, and 7, namely, elimination of existing severe overcrowding, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments, and replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the Hopkinton School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call vote. Amanda? Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. And a yes as well, and so that carries. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, thank, thank you. you. So before we move on to old business, we are um, fairly 
uh, running fairly late. It's 9.20. Does anyone need a five-minute break <coughs> or do you just want to plow through? Let's plow through. I, I will plow through. Yep. Okay. I would like a two-week break. <laughs> <laughs> what did she have what did say? What did you say? Seven-minute seven word break. limit? Is that what you said? Yep. No, two yep. weeks. Two-week break. Oh. That. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda, old business capacity study report. Dr. Kemp. Okay, so you have all of these slides in your um, packet. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was I think uh, what's in your packet is an October iteration of this. The November iteration is up on the screen. And one of the committee members had asked me a question about, I will show it to you in a moment. Let me get to that place. To marathon, so for example, um, what you have in your packet right here under marathon where it says facility needs at maximum enrollment, what the capacity study um, architectural firm DRA has done for us here, so it would say that you needed an additional <laughs> three kindergarten, additional three first grades, additional self-contained special education classrooms with toilets, but you have on yours it would say practice rooms. Uh, what they did was they put in anything that was MSBA reimbursable based on that population. When we got to the November iteration of this, we said, oh, you should take that out. People will wonder why that's in there. And people must be wondering because someone on the committee asked. So just so you know why that's there, we have no intention of putting music practice rooms in. But if we wanted them, they would, in fact, be reimbursable. Uh, so I don't know if you have questions or if you want me to walk through this one more time. What does everyone else want to do? I did take a look at it. I mean, my questions are more around the numbers um, and just talking through that a little bit and saying, um, as we are embarking on some of these conversations, and perhaps I'm mixing item number A as well as item number E here. Right capacity study report leading into the community engagement group, if you will. The things on my mind are, you know, we have done a great job, um, you all have done a great job in getting us to a place where we have the high school extension ready to go and the portable classrooms. So I would want us to, besides the condition that you showed us with Elmwood School, be able to articulate um, the projections for the student growth in the upcoming years, specifically in Elmwood, because if you think about it, when we say, let's say 100 kids are coming up and you know a layman tries to apply that or spreads it across 13 grades, and then you spread it by 13 classrooms, it's not a lot. However, we have seen that the concentration <coughs> of the students uh, many times is happening in certain grades. So how, can, how do we justify this growth beyond the 234? I think 234 next year is a big number. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, um, if I remember it correctly, those numbers were tapering. And again, you know, at this point, I cannot say I have a lot of confidence on any of these projections. Really, I'm sorry. I'll have to see the 234 play out before uh, having any confidence because in the couple of years, three years that I have seen these numbers, the projections, you know, the person comes in with such authority, such knowledge, and they present it, and we are always off. Mm -hmm. Are you? Ms. Uh, yes, NASDAQ, are you thinking that the numbers that we see is actually going to be higher? I have no idea. Right? I mean, 234 sounds great. I, I think that seems on the higher end, really. But I'm questioning the 100 thereafter, or in that range. But I, I guess I'm just wanting to hear your thoughts on it. And you know, you are in the details with all of this, and specifically the second and third grade. And even Hopkins, where we have done some of the you know, portable classrooms, so the high school, we're doing all of this. So at what point will we become like, OK, you know, this is becoming uncomfortable. I mean, it's already uncomfortable. Uh, how bad is it? There's maintenance aspects, but from a classroom growth impacting the instruction. So that's what I am looking for, not necessarily walk through of every slide. That's me. Have we, I mean, I feel like that's been brought up every, like as we listen to all of the budget asks over the course of the fall, when we see pictures of the, you know, 27 kids and kids learning in the hallway, I feel like that, to, to your questions, I feel like those are the things that, those are the realities. 
you know, if we had 10 new kids join in January, join Hopkins in January, that's a half a classroom joined in just one month in January. So I think, I think we've been getting those things. It's just that we haven't had it all in one place. It's, it's when building, um, our director of buildings and grounds came in and said our custodial staff cannot keep these buildings clean enough with all of these kids in it anymore. And when our principals come in and say, we have you know, 30 kids enrolled in an AP class, that AP instructor has to grade 30 lab reports. That's too many. So I feel like we've been getting the, those messages. We just put, haven't been getting them all in one place. So mm -hmm. Jen, I hear what you're saying. I think what we have looked at is the short term. To me, the capacity <coughs> study is a more longer range, right? We're talking about 10 years. When we're talking about building a new school, or thinking about programming, or thinking about staff needs as we build these, we need to look at those 10 years, right? And, no, and when we talk about Elmwood submitting SOI, it's not going to happen now, even if we submit and get the funding, it'll take us five years. So I would really like us to look to the future a little bit, look at you know where do we see this concentrated, and that's what I'm interested in as an outcome out of this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and again, I think that we've, we've done that with the um, projections, that the DRA projections. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, too, I know a lot of people have asked for 10-year plans, and I appreciate the need to, to plan, for sure. But I think 10 years ago, if anyone said there'd be 4,000 students in the Hopkinton Public Schools, people would have been like, there's no way there's going to be four. You know, I feel like 10 years is such a long way out in a community that you need a plan, you need a vision, you need to have a direction that you're going. But to get value out of a number that's 10 years in the future, I mean, n no one would have thought we'd be in the position we're in right now. So I hear you, but I also feel like we can't plan for too short term, but we need to look at the numbers that we've been given and use them to fuel what, what it, there's, not, no other, there's no other source of information. That's all we've got. You know, I think that we've looked at buildable lands, we've looked at um, birth rates, we've looked at um, people who have moved in and moved out and home turnover sales. There's no other source of data, you know what I mean? Like I think if we use those numbers to make projections for the future, those are the numbers we got to use. And I'm not saying no to not using those numbers, that's fine. All I'm saying is using that to break down and articulate you know, the growth related needs and the expansion going into the next 10 years. So the numbers that we had though looking 10 years put us at almost 5,000 students. Right. And that I, I right. feel like when we look at the past 10 years, and I, I think T Jen's point is absolutely spot on, 10 years ago, people would have laughed us out of the room they if we had said we were gonna be looking at, you know, right. less than 100 kids away from 4,000 right now. The thing that, you know, has played out every single year is that the projections that we've been given have consistently been low. Right. Even even prior to the um, the newer developments that we've had in town, our projections have not. We have exceeded them. And was it two years ago when we had somebody from Nesdek came in and said that Hopkinton, the rate that we're growing at, we're an anomaly in the state. They're not seeing this in other places. And I know I watched the select board meeting the other night on, from home, and I, one of the figures that jumped out is that our school age population is higher as a percentage, I think 23% than any of the surrounding towns. And we, we talk about the growth that we're seeing from expansion in town, but what doesn't get as much headlines that we're seeing, I know you're seeing in who's enrolling in the schools, is the number of homes that are turning over. Yeah. But I also know just because I have high schoolers, the number of students who's where the youngest child in the family is graduating the number of those homes that are going on the market and being sold to families with you know, <coughs> kids coming into the schools and i know that um hometown hospitality anecdotally will say they go to every new home in town and every new purchase in town so that's move-ins that are not just new construction but also turnover and it's you know surprising even to her Mm -hmm. to see how many of these homes are <laughs> less, yes, are seeing homes that had either one graduating or no children currently enrolled because they've already graduated, turnover and having new kids come in. Mm -hmm. yes. And Growth Study Committee even made the suggestion, like, is there a way to find out if someone moves in with, a, with an infant or a one-year-old? Right. 
But the reality is that the answer is no. No, no. no except <laughs> people can move in and don't need to home, report their children. Home, hometown hospitality right. does meet with them if they if they peek and see. But there's, there's no way to, walk, to know. Yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like I mean I hear what you're asking me, and I think it's important. But I feel like we have the numbers, we have the information, and it's been presented to us, and so we know. Like this is how much we've grown in the past, and this is how much they think we think we're going to grow in the future. And will that play out? There's no way to know. But I think that if you look at folks, you know, even just home turnovers was 100 and something kids this year. That's a, that's a big number, or over the last three years, excuse me, over the last three years. But that's a, that's a big number, 103 new kids in three years just because people sold their homes. So, I, you know, I think we've got that info. And now we look at these buildings. And the buildings, too, even, I, I think don't play um, paint a, a totally accurate picture because there's a lot of blue in these buildings. That means that they're oversized. And I think the um, when the folks from DRA, DRA did the presentation, they spoke well about that. And some, I think maybe Amanda spoke well about it too about how, you know, it says that the auditorium is big enough, but we know the auditorium is not big enough. Right. We can't get one grade in the auditorium. Right. So we know from experience that it's not, even though this, these reports technically say that they are, and that the cafeteria is not big enough, and, and other places in, in the school where grades populate are not big enough. I mean, we have kids eating at the pub tables right outside the door here, mm -hmm. then the cafeteria is yeah. not big enough. And they go to four lunches. And, the and there's two lunches. lunches. They're eating lunches when some people are eating breakfast. Yeah. 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 Right. It's true. Mm -hmm. So... Sorry, I, I can't, you guys are on the delay, so the video that I'm seeing is not the audio that I'm hearing, so if I'm interrupting, I'm so sorry. Um, so I had an opportunity to look at Dr. Wagman's report, as well as the slides. I think the two things made up the deliverable of the capacity study, and the, the report, if you haven't seen it, it's, um, it's a lot of detail around the assumptions on the um, projections, right. and I'm Personally, I'm willing to kind of go with the projections in a sort of a, it's like sort of a guess and check. I mean, we have to keep on checking reality versus projections. But um, a lot of things that stood out for me is that I've seen other districts where they um, they plan for 10% more than they have. Like there was no buffer that I saw in the plan. Um, another thing that came out to me is I think we're using national standards on number of kids per two bed. <laughs> And Hopkinton, by the nature of the town, <coughs> is a family town. I think we've talked about how many kids we have. I'm not sure that the kids per two family or three, or sorry, two bedroom or three bedroom household are the same as the national average. So we picked some indices, and you know, I don't know if they're right or wrong, but they, they're just little areas where I think, well, it's like a red flag for me to kind of watch it. But I sent you guys earlier today. Um, and forgive me, I'm fading really fast here, but I sent you guys a, a spreadsheet that I tried to put all of the highlights of the data in one place because it helped me look at it. Yeah, I'm just um, looking at it, Amanda. I just opened it up. It's in the mailbox. Yeah. So the thing that stood out for me when I, because the, the data that Dr. Wagman gave us was um, pretty much at the elementary level and then middle school and high school. And um, I kind of looked at it by school because that's those are the, the buildings that we're dealing with. Um, at the moment. So when I looked out um, to see where the pinch points are, I mean, obviously Elmwood and Hopkins are the, the pinch points now and like in the immediate next few years. I, re I worry a little bit about our, our build. I mean, if we get invited in, not really opening the doors, even start great breaking ground until 2025. I feel like we're going to miss the peak demand of those schools. So for me, what that led me to consider is, you know, looking at the next 10-year horizon, again, again, checking as we go how these estimates are, what besides capacity is going to drive our building? So we have other things. I mean, capacity is a, a huge thing. We are obviously addressing it um, in the immediate term with temporary classrooms and the high school expansion. So that will alleviate some of the pain, especially for Elmwood and Hopkins. But... If we look out, like you see, the middle school and the high school are going to be in a crunch later on. Yeah. Um, Amanda, but I think that, Amanda, may I request I think, you to just walk through the spreadsheet a little bit, please? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Um, so it's just on the 
it's the first column is the school and I added the date bill which was the only piece of data that was not in the Dr. Wagman's report or the slides I think the classroom square footage enrollment and peak enrollment all came from Dr. Wagman's uh, work and then in the box were the suggested spaces I think Dr. Kavanaugh talked about earlier um, what MSBA would support for the peak projected enrollment, I think is how, it, if I, correct me if I've got that wrong, but so again, things like the practice rooms for marathon, we don't really need practice rooms for marathon. Um, this is a, this is an MSBA look. We would then have to overlay that with what is priority for us. But when I looked at what they were recommending, you can see that first column is the number of classrooms. And then there are small group rooms, science labs, sped rooms with toilets, sped small group rooms, uh, music practice rooms or art rooms, tech classrooms, um, media center space. Again, the MSBA seems to um, support very large media centers, and I don't know how that aligns with our intention of how to use a media center, so it's a, it's a question. I don't know if that would be a learning common, which is another kind of word that is used more often, I think. I'm not sure. But auditorium, cafeteria, and kitchen. There were a couple of other miscellany, but these are the highlights that I pulled from the slides, just to kind of capture it in one place. And again, I'm sharing it just in case you also find it helpful to see it in one place. I thought I would share. That's good. Um, it, I, yeah. I put in red the numbers that seemed a little alarming. Um, a lot of the numbers are alarming, but like the um, middle school cafeteria is very small. We know that for the size, even now, but also for the size projected. Um, and just a few of the numbers of classrooms, I, the ones, that's where judgment comes in, the ones that I made red, I thought they seemed like big numbers. Um, and then over to the side, were Dr. Wagman's um, pre predictions um, year by year of enrollment. And he did, um, at the school level for the middle school and the high school, I just, um, took his elementary projections and broke it out by Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins. And so it, for me, it just asks, it, again, it kind of begs the question, like, um, I, I absolutely agree that Elmwood needs work. It needs, you know, we need a solution for Elmwood. What worries me and what I think I hear the community say a lot is what, do we have a plan? And so while I do know that Elmwood needs addressing. I do also worry about, I, I think we're going to have to make it one way or another through Elmwood and Hopkins peak enrollments as we are, because they're coming, whether we like it or not. There's no way we can get a new school in place before we're going to have to face 680 kids at Elmwood. So what else should we be looking at? And um, I'm, I had other other stuff I didn't send. I'm never sure what's going to violate open meeting law. So, but for me, there were like sort of four areas to look at these growth projections. Um, how do we make sure we have capacity to educate the students as projected and <coughs> each year we'll know more and we'll, we'll adjust our understanding, but we have to start somewhere. And I agree with Jen. We have a lot of numbers, mm -hmm. a lot of thought went into this. A lot of data points were considered. I think we can go with the numbers we have as long as we're, you know, a little, <laughs> skeptical or we watch them closely other than that there are other sort of needs that we have I mean we know Elmwood needs program space and Elmwood needs building repair both the HMS and HSS cafeterias are small parking and central office space the middle school is over 60 years old Elmwood's over 50 years old I think we have in our capital plan down the line a new track replacement and a football field which given what we're looking at I, it's I don't even know how we get to that um, and um, other educational spaces. So those, are, like, I think we've got another set of needs besides just can all the students find space to be educated. And then I think we have two really sort of, I think, more fun buckets of opportunity, like educational opportunity. If we did a two to five, we could reduce those transitions mm -hmm. and do some economies of, excuse me, scale with our programming. Um, we could simplify our transportation. And, you know, sort of there are other opportunities by, um, looking at our build plan and our campus plan. And then there are strategic programming needs. I mean, we're talking a lot about CVTE programming, which is so important, but what space do we have in the high school or middle school for a company to come in and do work, a workshop with students or to meet one-on-one -on -one in an office space? Like, how does our facility, 
how do our facilities support the strategic programming? Like we know Mr. Scott is bursting with robotics and there are lots of people who are demanding more and more robotics programming. Um, you know, we're a fine and performing institution. We have an auditorium in the high school that's too small and, you know, so forth and so on. So I think there's sort of capacity, there are other needs, there are opportunities, and then there's strategic programming, uh, things that need to be supported. So when I look at this capacity, I have no answers to this. I just wanted to share my thinking with you guys because when I look at the capacity study, I think it was critical that we do that. And we we obviously have investments to make. And I feel like um, the community is going to want us to think at least at the 50,000 foot level about how we holistically in the next 10 years prepare for all the red boxes and support the programming that's in demand and so forth. So that's kind of where I'm, I mean, I thought the capacity study was great. I think a lot of good information came out of it. Um, we didn't really talk in detail about the slides with the color coding to agree or disagree. Um, but other things I noted like in Elmwood, i uh, sorry, Hopkins, I think the um, classrooms are mostly deemed slightly undersized, which makes me a little bit worried about retrofitting Hopkins for bigger kids if we do a middle school there. I'm not sure the degree of investment we would need to make to do that. So I don't know, I, there, I have no point to this and I'm feverish. And I'm, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so I just wanna share with you a sort of my thinking so that you know, as we move forward with the SOI, with um, maybe the subcommittee and, and everything else, we just have a shared discussion on these elements. Amanda, I, I really appreciate all the work you have done here in trying to put all of this on, on the spreadsheet. It will take me some time to absorb uh, what you have put out here. But I, I am in complete agreement about looking at, uh, you know, this data for the 10-year projection out, right? Um, I am still doubtful about, you know, beyond the 234, the upcoming year's projections. I hope those are accurate, but that's where I think they, they might be lower, really, but we'll see, right? We can't figure that out right now. Well, I don't even know next year if you're going to go back to Dr. Wagman, or if you're going to NESDEC, or if you're not going to anyone and we're going to do something locally. I don't know that yet. Um, however, I do think that long-term planning is needed and I think along with space to some of the things that Amanda talked about um, the learning needs right we talk about these numbers and I think we have said it in the past that the numbers do not articulate the needs enough right so one child is not equal to another one child so it's not one to one every child is different and they bring different needs so what is it that we are looking for what does a student body need and how are we looking at some of the programming um, that are planned based on our strategic plan? Uh, you know, we have talked about the individual pathways. We've talked about CVT, CVT. There's one area that I have talked about in the past quite a bit, which I hope will bring back one of these months about the gifted and talented programming, um, or any other programming for that matter. So are there any other needs that we need to talk about? And I guess this is just a conversation right? There's no concrete action that we are able to take right now. And hopefully the work of the committee that we are looking to formulate here will talk about spaces in terms of the educational space needs also, right? Based on the programs that we are talking about. One thing that we also need to remember, like it's wonderful to have these numbers. You know, Dr. Wagman says it's like catching smoke. So we don't know if they become real or if they don't until we live through it. So capacity mm -hmm. is one thing. A second thing that's very important is what Mrs. Fargiano just talked about. Where do you want to take your programming, your grade configurations? All of that's very important. But if you sit in the meetings with our town partners, one of the things that Mr. O'Leary will tell us all the time is that these are amazing things to think about like what where are you going to put your robotics program or your CBT or make a, a performing arts center or those kinds of things which all of things uh, all of those are things that I would love to have as the superintendent 
um, but he will very frequently talk about our debt ceiling. And at some point, there, it, you know, we have to. I mean, I guess it's not dissimilar from what Jen, you were saying about transportation tonight. You've always got to weigh that student safety alongside of cost. I think we have to weigh capacity, programming, and cost. And when you talk to Tim, he gets very nervous about thinking about what it's going to look like in 2028 in Hopkinton. And I think we share that, right? What is it going to look like in 2028? <laughs> I think it's fair, f and I'm glad that Tim worries <laughs> about it. Oh, I, I do too. I, yeah. I'm very glad as a mm -hmm. you know, community yeah. member. I, I think he's doing a great job, Mr. O'Leary. Um, yes. He's bringing a belt of knowledge and information mm -hmm. and looking at projections going into the future and cautioning us to be mindful of all the things that we are lo desiring mm -hmm. and what is it that we can truly take on. So I think this conversation needs to happen. You know, our mm -hmm. needs versus desires versus uh, our capacity yeah. to borrow in the communities uh, absolutely yes absolutely. opinion on things if we're looking at considering a two to five school and looking at then I, I i love how amanda you put these numbers for us to look at because in my mind i could mentally then kind of picture some of the ideas that have come up about using hopkins differently and kind of adding that space into the as a campus that made it just easier to look at that way yeah and I think for me, I mean, to, to Dr. Kavanaugh's point about the debt ceiling, um, if we had all the money in the world, mm -hmm. then I think we would take, we would do the <coughs> two to five, we would address the, you know, the middle school, the high school, whatever, you know, the middle school's our oldest building. We'd, you know, if we had all the money in the world, it'd be great, but we, obviously we don't. And right. it's a huge burden for the taxpayer. So I think that's right. Um, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about, well, by the time, like an Elmwood school, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm for or against anything, I just don't know enough, but by the time an Elmwood Hopkins school would open, we would already have gotten through our capacity peaks. So is there some other investment that gives us more both strategic <coughs> programming and capacity bang for the buck that would take precedence if we look out down the road? Like that's where I kind of, I want to be, I don't want to be reactive. Like I think the community has been so supportive of us uh, in that year on year we've had growth that we, I don't know, we, we just weren't, we were trying to stick within our budgets and we didn't add capacity and we got to a breaking point this year and we said we need capacity and the community stood by us mm -hmm. with the temporary mm -hmm. classrooms and that was reactive and totally necessary. And I feel like now we have an opportunity to be more deliberate with more voices in the equation mm -hmm. and weigh out mm -hmm. capacity cost, strategic uh, programming, much of which happens more at the secondary ed level because that's where programming kind of diversifies a little bit. Um, but I, I don't know. I just want to make sure that as we move forward, we don't um, launch projects without some kind of a big picture in mind to give this, the taxpayers some expectation of what they're buying, what they're going to be buying over the next 10 years. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on the capacity study report? Okay. Thank you for bringing this back, <coughs> Dr. Kavanaugh. And I think a lot of this conversation will hopefully fold into some of the action items that you will plan out. And obviously, all of you are also working quite a bit on all of this and looking mm -hmm. at it. And you know, besides the day to day that you're working on. Right. Right. Uh, so. Okay. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. We have already covered item B. Item C, reporting to authority of suspected child abuse or neglect, Dr. Kavanaugh, policy GL. So I think that this is a policy that we took from MASC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we had had a conversation about you know, trying to incorporate a means in here so that there would be a reference for teachers. And what we have discovered is that DESI would actually just give us that. Mm -hmm. So we can create a link in here that would um, attach right to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website, which um, guides teachers in that process. Okay, yeah. any comments, thoughts? Have we reached that point where we are not processing enough information? I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting there. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's too late in the night. It's almost 10 o'clock. Right. It's, and we right. started at 6.30, so just checking with everyone. Uh, do we want to continue or bring some of this back? I think it, it's better for everyone's health to bring this back because it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> Can I 
one request that, I mean, the policy I think might be a quick one, but then yeah, the sure. only other thing that I would love to know um, is Dr. Kavanaugh and I met to draft the community engagement group. Um, so if, it's, if it turns out it's going to be a long discussion, we can put it off. But I think if we could get that going, the sooner the better, especially in light of all the conversation that we just had. Okay. So why don't we first decide on item JL? Okay. If there are any comments or thoughts. Do we want to bring this back? Item JL, are we ready to vote? I think we're ready. To, yeah. ready to vote. Okay, I would like um, a motion to accept policy JL, reporting to authorities suspected child abuse or neglect. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call <coughs> vote. Amanda? Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Um, I have some thoughts on the community engagement group. I feel like it will be a good 10-minute conversation, if okay. not longer. Um, so if, um, and I know we have two members who are not feeling very well tonight as well. <coughs> so I'm just wondering if we, if we can bring it back on the 27th. What that's did you? It's fine. I, I think that's fine. We'll bring it back on the 27th. Okay. So Do we, we need to, um, does Dr. Kavanaugh need, um, need to have the indicators before the 27th? Do you feel like that's not? Okay. No, I'm All right. fine. Okay. Because I know that's a long one, too. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to skip to the future agenda items. Anything? Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the next item, public comments. Anyone from the public interested in making comments? <laughs> come on over. Come on up. It's a minor comment. Um, <coughs> if you wouldn't mind introducing yeah. yourself, yeah. please. Thank you. I'm Leah Butler Rafferty. I live at Five Middle Land Drive. I have one <coughs> child who's graduated from the high school and one child that is graduating. And um, in general, this conversation has been great. But one thing that I think is often missing when we talk about facilities is things like restrooms. My two children avoid the restrooms in the high school like the plague, they won't go in. They say they're awful. And they love the high school in general. Mm. But I would think that that would also be a problem with having so many children, right? The facilities and everything are getting overused. So that type of comment, I don't think I hear a lot about. And I think it, <laughs> it really does affect the kids to you know, not be able to use a restroom the entire day at school. Um, so I was hoping that maybe some of the kind of more practical small matters that come with the overcrowding could be discussed as well because I think it's also easier to to um, to kind of connect with that right you can think a little bit more about that whereas the projection of you know how many 35 kids versus 30 kids in a classroom how does that really affect the kids sitting in the classroom. But when you start talking about things like that, then people are like, oh. So that was my only no, thought on the whole yeah. conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. For sticking around all this while, I'm your comment. Items by consensus. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, I have a superintendent. I recommend that the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call vote. Amanda? You can't hear you. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Looking for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Roll call. Amanda? Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. Our next meeting is on February 27th at 7 p.m. right here at the high school. We will be taking up these two um, items in the old business, item D and E, along with other agenda items at that meeting. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Bob. Thank you.